The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Monday. Thank you so much for being with us. A new show. I know I promised to be here on Friday and I couldn't because of family obligations, but I'm back today. And we have so much to talk about. We're going to be with you live for the next three hours talking about topics all on the autism spectrum, how we can be more effective, more efficient working with our children on the spectrum, whether you're a parent, a teacher, practitioner, I know that that's important to you and we'd love to hear from you to tell us why that's important to you and what kinds of things that you're working on what kind of things you're struggling with whether it's actually teaching your child something or getting to the teaching or knowing what to teach or arranging the funding so that your child can get the most possible opportunities and the highest opportunities uh, I am a huge fan of ABA and that's one of the things that we talk about the most probably here on the show for a very good reason. First of all, it's the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism, so that's a really good reason for talking about it. Second of all, it is effective in treating all of our children. Whether your child is on the spectrum and greatly affected or only slightly affected, or you have children who aren't on the spectrum but are exhibiting challenging behavior, whether you have children who are not on the spectrum and are having no challenging behavior, I don't know you if that's you. <laughs> Because, <laughs> I, you know, children are going to engage in challenging behavior at some point, right? ABA is effective for all of our kids. By the way, it's effective for us, too. Isn't that a win-win-win? Uh, so there are lots of good reasons to talk about it. It also is something that is a very broad topic. All of our kids are different, so they require different things, but ABA gives us a tool set that we can pull things out of our tool belt and say, hey, in this instance, I need to use these four tools in this way, and I'm going to get creative with it and have great results. For this other child, I need to do this, that, and the other thing, and for my mother-in-law, I need to, <laughs> right? Because it works on mother-in-laws, too. Uh, I am not fortunate enough to have a mother-in-law because unfortunately uh, she passed away before I had the opportunity to meet her but I hear mother-in-law stories in any case uh, ABA effective for all of us because it deals with behavior and since we're all engaging in behavior all the time uh, very effective we can give you the tool kit I constantly need refreshers on the toolkit which brings me to probably the biggest reason why we talk about ABA here in in my opinion why I talk about it so much much because I am the mother of a now nine-year-old. Uh, uh, he just turned nine last Tuesday. I'm still getting used to it. Feels funny to say that, but he was diagnosed with autism at two and a half. He is now nine and uh, you know those are some scary days some really scary days where I didn't know where we were going to end up. My child regressed into autism, so he had language and virtually lost all of it. And I, like a lot of you, sat there late at night and thought, I, I don't know, am I ever going to be able to have a conversation with my child? Am I ever going to know what my child's thinking? Am, am, are my child and I ever going to talk about things in a substantive way? And I can tell you, quite honestly, that I am there now because of ABA. My child is not done. We're still working on things, but I can have conversations with my child and he tells me what he's thinking and what he's feeling and that is because of ABA. Uh, so if it seems like I'm a huge fan of ABA, uh, it's no mistake. And if it seems like I'm a huge fan of the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, please do not mistake that either because I am. They are the ABA provider who gave me back my child. I, I know, like, you know, that 
doesn't say it all, then I don't know what would. So I am unabashedly and unapologetically a huge fan of theirs. I always like to tell you that I know that Card is not the only ABA provider, um, but they were ours. So I'm always going to talk a little bit glowingly about them, but I'm going to urge you to find ABA services wherever you are, the best quality ABA services that are available to you. Um, and that's important. I want you to find your way to that. Uh, and there are lots of different ways that you can do that. That's one of the things that we'll talk about on the show. But what I've asked again and again and again, and some of you are starting to write in and we're talking about this. I'm so excited about it. But I want to know from you, what's preventing you from ABA? And whatever it is, is it the funding? Is it the time? Is it that you don't live close enough to one? You don't know who to use? Please write to me and tell me because that's the problem that I want to help you to figure out. And there are some solutions to all of those problems. Depends on where where you live, depends on what your insurance situation is, but don't walk this path alone. I'm here and there's a whole lot of people that you can't see that are here with you too that want to help you as well. How can you partake, uh, partake in the conversation, participate in the conversation? Lots of different ways. Last week we were having some problems with our live feature. It is working again, which is a really fun thing. If you're watching us on autism-live.com, uh, you'll see there are a lot of different things on that site. It's changing a little bit. Change is difficult, but it's a great thing, right? Uh, and and we, we had, as I mentioned, we had some technical difficulties, but now the Your Question box is completely functional. So if you go to autism-live.com, you'll see that it either says live or rebroadcast. If it says live, you will have the ability to write a question into the Your Question box, hit enter, and it appears magically right here on my screen. Don't you love technology? Uh, and then you and I can be having a conversation. You can be having a conversation with whatever guest I have on the show. Uh, if you you watched an old show and there was a guest and you want to ask a question, you can ask it in live time and we'll hunt that person down. That's the thing that I love to do is try to track down answers for you. Uh, if you're watching us and it says rebroadcast, you're watching in any of the other ways that you can watch the show, you can still ask questions in a variety of different ways. Emily just put up uh, the email address there for you. You guys were doing so good last week emailing us when we didn't have the live question function working. But please email us no matter where you are in the world. I know for many of you, you're watching it. It's two o'clock in the morning our time, but it's eight o'clock in the morning your time, right? Uh, don't hesitate. I, I know at least two people last week said, well, I hate to bother you. You are not bothering us. We are here for you. Please use it, right? Uh, so take part in the conversation. Give us your suggestions. Give us your comments. If there's something that you're seeing on the show that you go, you know, this isn't as useful to me, please let us know. That's exactly the kind of information that we want to know. And if there's something that we can help you with, whether it's just be somebody to listen, because I know how that is, right? Sometimes you just need somebody to hear you say, this is not going well, this is not fair, somebody is uh, preventing us from getting something, sometimes you just need to vent, right? Or to know that it at, that this too shall pass, right? Uh, but please participate in the conversation. There is the email. You can also phone us. We have a phone line. You can leave a message or you can talk to us. You can, if it's during the live show, you can even be patched into the live show. We can have a conversation right here on air. So don't hesitate to do that. If you leave a message, please know that we will get back to you with all due speed the next time that we're here in the studio. By the way, you can also Skype into the live show. If you've got, you know, we have somebody that's going to Skype in today with out picture, but if you have picture, you can Skype in with picture as well. I know for many of our international viewers, it's a really inexpensive way of being able to connect with us. So please use Skype. We love that. Uh, you can also Facebook with us too. This is a really fun way. We give you the question of the day and a lot of you are answering the question of the day and talking to each other and supporting each other. And I just, I can't tell you how much I enjoy that aspect of being able to interact with you that you're not only am I able to interact with you, but you're interacting with each other and it's so important that we hold hands together on this journey, right? All of our kids are different. All of our journeys are different, but there is an element to this that let's be honest, we get in a way that a whole lot of other people on this planet don't get. And there is something relaxing and fortifying to know that when you're talking to somebody who gets it, a really good thing. And you can also tweet with us. We love it when you tweet with us. I am not as proficient with Twitter as I'm hoping to be, but I'm 
I'm a work in progress, right? <laughs> so uh, for those of you who like to tweet, please feel free to tweet with us. All right, there are lots of different ways that you could be watching the show. I mentioned that. You can be watching us on Blip TV, a wonderful way. Uh, we have a channel there. You can watch old episodes. Uh, you can watch today's episode a lot of the time. Sometimes it takes a couple of hours before it's up there. But you can rewind, fast forward, pause, do all of those things. You can also do that on YouTube, by the way. We have a YouTube channel. You can watch us there. We appreciate our YouTube viewers. And you can also download us on iTunes, which is a really wonderful thing. And uh, you can even subscribe there. We especially love it especially love it when you leave a comment for us on uh, a review on iTunes. That's a really uh, wonderful thing if you're in the mood to do that. And we are also on Ustream. So lots of different ways to watch us. All of them are free. And that's a really important thing for those of us here. We're trying to give you information in a format that's flexible and free so that you can use it and interact with us. That's really genuinely what we're here for. So please take advantage of it however it best suits you. And if there's a way that we are not currently uh, available that would be awesome for you, let us know and we'll do everything we can to make that happen. All right, uh, we like to start every morning with something that I fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. The jargon of the day is meant to kind of clarify what some of these terms are because we have to make friends with the jargon. I know it's exhausting, isn't it? <laughs> Don't you just want to scream sometimes and go, why can't we just talk about things in plain terms that regular people understand? Um, but you know what? Uh, we have to make friends with the jargon. And uh, when we do, we are more efficient, more effective working with our children and with the professionals that are going to be on the team. This takes a team, right? If you haven't discovered that yet, if you're brand new to this community, uh, I, you know, first of all, I have to say to you the thing that was said to me and that I say to everybody, well, welcome to the club. This is the club that nobody signed up for and said, oh, I especially want to be in this club. But you'll find that now that you're here, there's some really wonderful people here, uh, wonderful people who speak in terms of jargon. <laughs> so we have to make terms, make friends with these terms. Uh, and then we will be more effective, more efficient members of our, our child's team. And I know how important that is to all of us, right? Okay, so today's, uh, <laughs> today's phrase that we're going to demystify is DTT. Uh, you probably have heard of this. And, you know, uh, well... Let me give you the actual definition and then we'll, we'll talk about this. So DTT stands for Discrete Trial Teaching. Um, training or training, discrete trial training, some, they're interchangeable, but training that focuses on a single cycle of behaviorally based instruction routine. Okay. Um, if you don't know what it is, I don't know that this would get you any closer to understanding what it is. Let's look at our working definition. DTT is teaching one targeted behavior at a time. And that's a really watered down version of what this actually is. But we got to start somewhere, right? Uh, but for those of you who are a little bit more experienced in the field of autism and psychology, uh, this term, this uh, definition probably is making you a little high beat. But we have to start somewhere. So and that's the whole point of why we use DTT. We want to set up a circumstance. Imagine if you were trying to learn something and you went to a carnival and you were going to, you were going to learn, I don't know, how to tie your shoes at a carnival. And there's all these distractions, all these things going on, right? Um, or if you were trying to teach a child how to laugh, right? And you go to a carnival, then the child's going to be laughing, right? But you're not going to know exactly what it was that made them laugh. So we try to isolate a little cap capsule of behavior and work on it in that little capsule so that we can strengthen it and know that we actually strengthen that and that we didn't muddy it up with other stuff that we actually know that we've taught this individual thing and what we're trying to teach in DTT is something's going to happen you're going to behave in a certain way and when you do there's going to be a very specific consequence we talk about this on the flip side all the time the ABCs of behavior that we the A is the antecedent the B is the behavior and the C is the consequence 
The antecedent is whatever happened before, right, that led to the behavior, that led to the consequence. So we take this three-term contingent, they call it, and we try to encapsulate it, just put it all together and not muddy it up with anything else. So when we're teaching something to a child and we know there's a targeted behavior we want, that B, right, um, we want the child to cough. Let's say, let's say that's the skill we're trying to teach the child. I know it's kind of a weird skill to teach, but uh, children have to cough. So we want to teach that cough and we got to say something to get the child to cough or do something or present something or show something to get the child to cough. Well, in DTT terms, that's called the SD. It's the thing that we do or say or show to get the behavior. And then once there's the behavior, we make sure to follow it with a consequence. So I might say to a child, cough, right? That's my antecedent or my SD. The child coughs and then I go, good coughing, right? And I've encapsulated it all in one thing. What I've done is not make it so the child talks and laughs and coughs and I say good job and they don't know which thing got the good job, right? Um, have you ever done something and uh, you know, you, I, I don't know, you started taking a vitamin or you started exercising and all of a sudden you feel better and you go, I don't know whether it was that I started eating more green vegetables or I started taking the vitamin or I got a half an hour more sleep or I was exercising. You don't know which thing created the result or if they all did, right? It can make it really difficult. And we're adults. We're discerning. We can figure out and go, well, you know, the, but sometimes you just don't know. Well, in a scientific experiment, it's really important to keep keep things clear uh, because then we know what caused the result. We want to keep things that clear for our kids because if we're teaching them this is the behavior I want you to do so I'm going to reward you for it, it's got to be all encapsulated so the child isn't confused. Um, I, you know, this is a strange example but uh, years ago uh, a friend had written a play and there was a moment in the play where uh, a little girl was talking to her grandmother and she was saying, oh, this boy at school really hates me. And uh, the, the grandmother says, well, why do you think that? And the little girl says, because he hits me on the playground. And the grandmother says, oh, honey, that just means that that little boy likes you. That's what little boys do when they like you. And I remember reading it in the play and going, oh, well, that's a bad thing to teach. But haven't we all, uh, well, those of us who are at a certain age, we certainly heard that at some point, right? Oh, well, the little boys on the playground hit you because they like you, but a very confusing thing to say to a child. I don't think we would say that anymore, right? We need to be very clear the kinds of things that we link up to other things, right? Um, and make sure that we don't link up the wrong things. But from time to time, as parents and as teachers, we will mistakenly link up the wrong thing. Well, the great thing about DTT is because it isolates that little behavior, we're making sure that we didn't link up the wrong thing. What we're teaching is that if you do this, be if I say this and you do this, then good things happen. You're going to get this reward. So it encapsulates this behavior into this very clear three-term contingent. I'm going to say or do this, you're going to do the behavior, and then you're going to be reinforced forced for it. It might be good job, it might be tickles on your belly, but you're going to get some sort of reinforcement that you really like. We'll talk more about reinforcement later, but DTT, encapsulating it into that little three-term contingent, is a really ideal way to begin to teach any skill, especially to a child who is struggling, but really, truly for all of us. If we want to learn how to do a new skill, if we can encapsulate it and make sure that there is some sort of a reward for that little behavior, we're well on the way to making it happen. It, this genuinely works with our children. Um, my cautionary thing that I started with in the beginning is that it's really important to note that DTT is one element of ABA. It is not the same as ABA. ABA, I always talk about this, ABA is like the car. It's the whole vehicle and you're gonna drive the car and it's got switches and it's got a gas pedal and it's got an engine and it's got a gas tank, right? It's a big entity and ABA is the car, right? DTT would be like the steering wheel of the car. You would never say, I'm gonna take my steering wheel and drive to New York. You take your car, right? But you would never want to drive to New York without your steering wheel. So 
ABA, this big thing that involves a whole lot of stuff, one of them is DTT, there's also natural environment training, uh, there's fluency-based training, there's precision training. All of these things are going to make the car work really well. But you got to have a variety of them, right? We would never try to do ABA with just DTT. It makes me a little nutty sometimes when people refer to D DTT and ABA as one and the same. It isn't. And make sure that if you're having ABA that they're not just doing DTT. Your child is not going to get the progress that they need to get with just DTT. But man is DTT fabulous for beginning to teach a skill. So super duper fabulous. If you've ever been, I'm a former teacher, and if you've ever been in that circumstance with your child where you go, I just don't even know how to begin to teach this because they're not getting it. They're just not getting it. DTT ideal. Chunk it down into little itty bitty behaviors, string the behaviors together. You can get it done. Uh, but it is not the only thing you have to do. All right. Uh, okay, we always have a question of the day for you. The question of the day, we want you to participate and uh, tell us what your thoughts are and share them. It's, I think it's great for you to have a place to vent and be clear about things, but it also helps other people because sometimes they don't know the question to ask or sometimes they can't identify, you know, they're having thoughts and feelings about something and they just can't figure it out what, you know, we've all been there, right? So I think it helps all of us when you participate in this. Uh, today's question is, what do you wish your child's teacher knew about your child? And, uh, you know, there are so many different things to consider and this is not a negative to the teachers, by the way. I, I am a huge fan of most teachers. I think that people who devote their lives to teaching in the classroom, knowing that their pay is never going to be above a certain amount and that their job is always going to be challenging, I think that most of them are truly amazing saints walking this earth. Uh, there are exceptions, right? Um, there are some people who, for some reason, end up in teaching who really don't belong there. And ask any good teacher and they'll tell you that there are colleagues that they have that should not be teaching. Um, but I think the vast majority of them are really well intentioned. I will tell you quite honestly that um, it's a big soapbox that I get on anymore um, that I don't think that teachers are given the proper tools to deal with our kids. But honestly, I don't think they're given the proper tools to deal with behavior at all. Um, and that, I think, is something we all need to work to change. And it starts with one teacher at a time, um, but we can all band together and work for teachers to have those tools. And part of that is communicating with the teachers. So I want to know from you guys, if there was one thing that you wanted your, ch your teacher to know about your child, what would it be? I've been really lucky in that the teachers that my son has had have really been exceptional. Um, but you know, over the years, uh, there was one teacher in particular who was very young and very well-intentioned, but I remember sitting down to talk with her about my son uh, before the year started and saying, okay, you know, so how do you feel about the fact that you're going to have somebody on the spectrum in your classroom? And her response was, oh, I've had kids in the spectrum. You know, I know all about autism. Now for me, um, and she really did know quite a bit about autism, but for me, that that's usually an off-putting thing. If somebody says, oh, I know all about autism, I literally think to myself, my prejudice is that they're thinking of one child or maybe two children that they have known with autism. And you know that thing that we all say about if you know a child with autism, then you know one child with autism because our kids are all different. Um, so, uh, you know, what I conveyed to her in that moment is, you know, one of the things that's most important to me is that you look at him not as a diagnosis, but as an individual. That's what I'm going to ask you to do and not compare him to every other child that you've had with autism in your classroom and not make assumptions based on the label of autism, of what his behavior is or is not going to be or how he learns or doesn't learn or, you know, what kinds of expectations you should have. I'm going to ask you more than anything else to get to know my child and not leap ahead.
I'm telling you that there's a diagnosis because I think that's going to help you to sort it out. But please, please, please look at him as a, an individual. Um, and that's usually something, if I'm going to leave him in anybody's care, that I tend to throw in in some way. I'm really excited uh, about next year. Um, he, my son had a great teacher this year, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Um, but I'm really excited about everything that's going to happen for him next year. I'm already looking forward to that, already in discussions about what's happening in his classroom next year. And um, I'm really excited about that because um, the people who are on his team are who know him, know him really well. He's going into the fourth grade. And the people who are going to be new to the team are people that thus far as we're assembling the team, they're people who are really already excited about getting to know him as an individual, where he's at right now. Not where he was at in kindergarten, not where he was at in second grade, where he's at right now. That's really thrilling to me, I have to say. And I, I think... Uh, we're going to have an awesome year because of that. But I'd love to know from you guys, what's the thing that is your thing? What do you wish your child's teacher knew about your child? And then, of course, I'm going to say to you, you know, how can you make next year's teacher know that? How? What's the way in which you can convey that? Because it's different, right? For different teachers and different parents and different children. Uh, how do you go about without making somebody defensive or turning somebody off or make them think you're pushy? How do you go about getting that information across. Uh, and it's different every year, right? Uh, but really interested to hear. We're going to look at these responses in the 10 o'clock hour. All right. We also always have a topic of the day. And today our topic of the day is challenging behavior. And this means so many different things, right? Um, you know, it could be as simple as a child who um, has some sort of self, uh, I want to say stimulatory, and that's, you know, not really the right term, but some sort of stereotypy that they do, that they be, they, they, whether they rock or they hum or make little noises or do something with their hands, you know, some sort of repetitive thing that makes them feel better. Uh, or has some sort of a payoff for them. So that could be a challenging behavior, being violent uh, towards themselves or to other people or to objects. That can be challenging behavior. Uh, there are so many things that could be included in challenging behavior, including sleep disturbances and feeding issues. So we're going to try to put things through the filter of challenging behavior today. In fact, I think that's our topic this entire week. Because the truth is that that's the stuff that wears us out, right? It's the stuff where you just get on your very last nerve and it eats at your hope. And when we can, the flip of it is, is that when we can change a challenging behavior and redirect it into something that's a positive behavior, oh, it's such a relief and such a party. So, and we can, we can change challenging behaviors. Um, We'll talk about that and a whole bunch of different things having to do with the function of a behavior. The truth is, is that all of our, all of the behaviors that our child can engage in, whether they're challenging or not, they're all behaviors that serve a purpose. So we don't do much. I don't think we do anything unless it serves a purpose. We certainly don't do it again and again and again unless it is in some way reinforcing. So if we can take that emotional divorce, step back, look at the challenging behavior and say, okay, what is the payoff here for my child? That opens us up to a world of information and a world of possibilities of changing something because we can take away the payoff we can give a different payoff we can put a replacement behavior in that gets the same payoff but has it's actually appropriate to do and, and it spends less energy to get to what they want and we can change our lives we can change their lives their outlook on things and we can change our lives as parents and teachers. Very exciting stuff. Okay, some of the things that we're going to do today, uh, we're going to talk, it's Monday, 
So on Monday, we talk a little bit about stress, how, because this, it's part of this ride, right? Uh, part of this roller coaster ride. <laughs> there, you can't have a stressectomy. It's not going to happen. But we have to find the ways of dealing with the stress, reducing the stress, and coping. This is a really good topic for me today, <laughs> right? Uh, we're going to take on biting this morning, um, which is a problem that a lot of you have written in and said that you have issues with. And we're going to talk about the function of biting because there is always a function for biting and how to look at your child's behavior and start to gauge, okay, wait a second, what is the function of this particular biting? Um, and then later on today, I'm really excited about this, we're going to have a dad on. Sean Colton is going to be with us. He is uh, authoring the book Legends of the Boo Monster. We're going to ask him what the boo monster is and how we can potentially help him to end up having this book on our shelves. He's a dad blogger. You guys know I love that. I, you know, we talk about stress all the time and that one of the ways that a lot of people find to reduce their stress is to write. And, you know, never before in the history of man has, has it been easier to write and be in a public forum than it is now because we have blogging. And I love the fact that so many of you write and say what you're feeling and then the rest of us have the opportunity to read and go, oh, yes, um, that that relieves your stress, helps us relieve our stress. It really is a higher calling. Uh, so he is a dad blogger who is working on a book and we're going to talk to him about that. And if you're a blogger and want to be on the show, I hope that you'll write in and tell us because we're very interested in what you're doing uh, and it's helpful to all of us truly so uh, those are the kinds of things we're going to be talking about today with a whole host of other things we're going to introduce a new a word today and we have a ted talk uh, about perspective taking that we're going to show later on in the day very very exciting we got a big week for you guys this week so stick with us we're going to take a short break when we come back it is time for the stress tip of the week Mostly the behavior started at night, but it was invading the day where he would just speak one syllable and babble and pace around. When she was a year old, she lost speech. Um, she did never seem to request me for anything, even for food. He told me over the phone that I should just put her in an institution. I was devast I was what's an institution? A hospital. Yeah, isn't that nice? He told me that it was possible or likely that Ruffin would never be employed, that he would never work uh, productively that he would not know that I loved him, nor would he love me, nor would he be likely to marry. So there's a 50% chance that he won't be able to talk at all, but if he does talk, he will only be able to, you know, make simple um, desire requests, I want, things like that. And probably by the time he was 10, he'd be in a home. Doreen told me that he would recover, and Doreen told me that he would go to regular kindergarten. I really have a very normal kid now, and lots of normal worries, but not extraordinary ones. My name is Deli Popola, and I'm one of the creators of TheOtspot.com. TheOtspot.com is an online support system for families and specialists who are affected by autism across the whole world, share inspirational stories, find resources in their area. Um, hope you can join. Mostly the Welcome back to Autism Live. Night. Welcome back. There we are. Uh, and we're thrilled to have our stress tip of the week. I'm especially thrilled because I am, I'm just going to be honest and say I'm not walking my own talk. So really important for me to be here and admit that and uh, be reminded that we have to manage our stress, right? Uh, and what the, the thing that I wrote down to talk about specifically today is meditation. How important it is that we all find at least a minute or two a day 
that is just blank just blank and you know what and I and I really send this out to a good friend of mine who called me last week and I haven't had a second to call her back um, so this is my answer and you know who you are because she called me and she said okay this meditation thing I know you talk about it and I can't do it and I can't I, I get stressed and my mind starts to go a mile a minute and how do you make yourself calm down because she knows that I'm somebody who struggles with that too you got so much going on right and so many things that are on the to-do list and you sit down for two seconds and I have a friend who calls it monkey brain that it just won't stop another friend who calls it the the little uh, hamster on the wheel right the brain just keeps on going it's really important that we take ourselves wherever we are if you are so stressed that you can't close your eyes for a minute and take three breaths then that's where you are and we can get into a whole thing about, well, why? Why am I so stressed? But the whole point of meditation in the moment is to find some relaxation. And if we're and really finding relax, relaxation for the body and for the brain. And if we're standing there asking ourselves questions during the meditation time, it doesn't give the brain a break. I will tell you that like anything else, uh, it's like strengthening a muscle. Not that I would know too much about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> just keeping it real keeping it honest here in any case but it is something that you're not going to run out and run a marathon the first day that you're going to work out right that would be crazy you would never have an expectation of being able to do that and yet you know so you might say to yourself okay i haven't worked out in six months so i'm gonna start with jogging for 10 minutes and you discover that that was too much that that was too and you actually end up hurting yourself so we always have to be realistic right same thing with meditation that you're not going to have an expectation that you're going to be able to sit and meditate for a full hour if you've just started meditating and you're stressed out of your mind but instead of getting frustrated and saying well if I can't do it for an hour then I'm not going to do it at all start with where you are say you and you can set a timer or not but you can say to yourself I'm just going to sit and be quiet for a minute and you know and if it ends up being five minutes great uh, if you're really stressed and think well I don't have five minutes I really only have a minute you can set a timer if it gives you anxiety to meditate set it for a minute and say that's all I'm gonna do is for a minute and then move it in 15 second increments so you do a minute today and you do a minute and 15 seconds tomorrow but get yourself into a position that's comfortable and again apply where you are right now if you are, have back problems and sitting up in the typical you know sort of you know namaste kind of pose is not going to feel good for you then don't do that lay down and if your back hurts put your uh, knees up you can get yourself you know you don't have to do it on a floor or a mat you can do it on a bed make yourself comfortable it's not a time to work on everything else under the sun and you know you'll you'll find yourself laying there and your voice will say well you know but my posture so oh Never mind. You can literally say, mind, I'm going to deal with that in a few minutes, <laughs> but right now I'm just going to be. I'm just going to be and see if you can be. And if you can't do a minute, don't berate yourself for that. Try, try to see if you can do that for 10 seconds. And one of the things over the years that has helped me when I get into these spaces is that I want to get to white noise. I want to get to the point, have you ever had that experience where you're driving in the car and you kind of lose track of time and you don't remember where you were for the last several blocks, but you feel really rested uh, and you can't even remember what it was you were necessarily thinking about. Sometimes you were focused on one particular thing, but other times it's like, I don't even know where I was in my head. Was I safe? You know? Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that you were in a, in a white noise kind of space. Your brain was relaxing. It's actually a place where when you come out of it, you're really creative. Um, and you're much more likely to be able to handle stressful things. So we want to create an environment in which white noise can come. Uh, it's not the easiest thing. It's like chasing after something that can't be caught, right? <laughs> 
but uh, we can manipulate it a little bit by thinking of things that are one color. Whether you want to pick the color white and you picture snow, snow falling in a very quiet space so that you're looking at white and it's got areas of green and blue in it because you can see the sky or whatever. Um, or you can picture, you know, a purple flower. Uh, but give yourself one thing to focus on and it's amazing how your mind over time, not the first day, will start to relax. And your little thoughts will drift in and you'll go, I'm looking at a purple flower and just breathe, right? Um, if you can't do it with your eyes closed, you literally can do it with your eyes open. Uh, look at something. Try to look at something that is either of nature, like a flower, or something that is nondescript. Uh, I always laugh and say, if I've had a really stressful time and had too much, my brain's been thinking that I'm going to sit in a corner and stare at the wall and watch the paint dry. It's not even uh, wet paint. But literally, you can do that. You can sit in a corner and just stare at the wall, look at the wall. And if you find yourself with thoughts constantly coming up about, I got to do this and I got to do that, start to just, you can do it out loud or you can do it silently, look at the wall and go, I'm looking at the wall. There's the wall. It's white. You can focus on different parts of your body and say, I feel that twinge in my heel, or I feel my finger. At least you'll be present. And that is a vacation for your brain too. Um, so important that you breathe while you meditate. So important. Uh, we've talked about this on the show before that there is literally nothing in the world that can't be better handled by taking three deep inhales and exhales. And no matter what it is, you, you are much more prepared because all of the cells in your body have oxygen. I'm not saying that it makes it go away, but you're better prepared to deal with it. If we could find time you know, in the best of all possible worlds, we would all find time every hour to take three deep breaths. You know, it sounds like a really easy thing. And if we could do it, our lives would be, we would be healthier. We would be more centered. We would be more able to deal with things. That's a really hard thing to do. And I wouldn't start out with that expectation uh, that, okay, today I'm, I'm going to, you know, although you could, you could set your timer and say, that's all I'm going to do today is every time the timer goes off at the top of the hour, I'm going to stop and take three deep breaths. Um, but in any case, you have to find time to meditate. If it's that it's at night and, you know, the last thing you do when you lay down and you take the time to relax your body, um, and, and literally that can be a thing where you start at the top of your head or you could start with the bottom of your feet and concentrate on your toes and say, I'm going to let go of the energy in my toes. I'm going to let go of the energy in my calves. I'm going to let go of the energy in my knees. I used to love, I had a teacher who did this fabulous guided meditation where we would lay on a mat and she would say, think of each part of your body as a sandbag. And as you picture it in your mind's eye, uh, picture that somebody pokes the sandbag with a fork and all of your stress is the sand that slips out of the holes in the bag and you leave it on the beach. Uh, and for me, that was a great visual of, oh, you know, I can just let the sand, let the, let all of the stress just eke out. Um, you can do that to, to the point where you get relaxed and just try to be for a minute after you've done that. You would be in a much better place. And again, I hear myself saying this, this is what I need to be doing this week. Um, but take the time. Um, it's hard sometimes when you have little kids, especially little kids who have other issues, you know, been there, done that, and won't go to sleep so that you don't have that alone time for yourself. But uh, what I eventually did, and I've shared this on the show before, was that I would make my son sit and meditate with me for a minute. And I reinforced him for doing that. And you know what? The summer that we did that, he uh, loves the last airbender when it was Aang, the little cartoon. I really recommend that. It's on, on Nickelodeon and it's not on anymore in terms of new episodes. Now it's The Legend of Korra, which, you know, 
I'm I'm liking it, but it's not the same um, because the little boy, uh, the Aang, he meditated on a regular basis, and my son saw that and thought, well, Aang is cool, so I would sit and say, we're going to meditate like Aang, and he would sit still for a minute, a little boy who wouldn't sit still for anything else, um, and I got a minute, and we would sit with our knees together, right, he would be right in front of me, so I would know if he moved away, uh, it wasn't like I was ignoring him, I could close my eyes, and he would sit there, and we would breathe together uh, was really beneficial for him and it was really beneficial for me so why am I not doing that every day that's a really good question uh, but we all I need to walk my talk and we all need to take at least a minute I think you'll find if you take the minute the minute when the minute gets easy you can go on to two minutes and three minutes and five minutes and your whole day is better so we're gonna take a break and during the break if you have the time see if you can focus for just a minute on nothing else and again if the thought comes in I got to do this no nope, right now I'm just doing this by the way there's lots of free meditations guided meditations online that you can download on iTunes they're free um, and that's a great way if you have trouble guiding your own mind so find the time med meditate manage the stress I will too stick with us grateful for Autism Speaks because they allow families like me to have hope. They're working towards having these children live better lives. There's a space for you. Yeah, there's a world for you and there's a community that is behind you. And one that has really been able to be the singular voice for people who are involved with and who care about autism. I do have autism, but I don't let that become a disability for me. Autism Speaks is going to continue to help those who need it. And just look at all the stuff they've done so far, and you will be impressed. Three, two, one. Woo! You need to support the walks. We have to raise awareness, but we also have to raise funds to do the work. I'm grateful for Autism Speaks for one main reason, is they are allowing me to focus on the research. The work that Autism Speaks has been doing is critical for keeping autism research on the radar screen. We proclaim 2 April as the World Autism Awareness Day. I'm very proud of the UN and thankful Autism Speaks Getting the health mandate bill passed in New Jersey particularly, we needed to be able to make an argument, not just do this because it's the right thing to do, but do it because it's cost effective. When everyone else told me nothing was wrong with my son, I got information from a website that told me something wasn't right. I am so proud of Autism Speaks for creating these beautiful ad campaigns which have reached people who are not affected by autism and have also created a greater climate of compassion and understanding. It's been really great for Bachman to have gotten involved with Autism Speaks early on. I think everybody here feels like they really make a difference. To make sure that we generate as much money as we can for Autism Speaks so we can all solve this puzzle together. There's no way we could have come this far without our families, without our supporters to date, but there's so much farther we have to go, and everybody's invited to join this cause. We need all the help we can get to make the difference we know we can make. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. Our overriding topic today is challenging behavior, and right now we're going to take on biting. And I have to say that talking about challenging behavior is one of my favorite things to talk about. You know why? Because I, as a parent, when I was in it, 
and my child was engaging in challenging behavior, I was overwhelmed uh, with the behavior, what I thought it meant about me as a parent, what I thought it meant about my child's future, and it was this whole a huge emotional bubble that sucked the hope out of me, let's say that, just sucked the hope out of me because I would be in this fear of, is this going to continue on? Is this the autism? Am I ever going to be able to stop this? What I know now, after you know, so many years of my son doing ABA therapy and all the access that I have had to the experts, is that we can target these challenging behaviors and we can change them. That you know, sometimes it's difficult in terms of there may be 35 things that you want to target and you can't target all of them at the same time. But if you start chipping away and saying, well, this is the one that's the most concerning to us right now, or this is the one that seems to be the linchpin for all these other things, and we're going to target this one, you can make a difference. And it's usually fairly quick, depending on the function of the behavior. This is something we talk about a lot, that every behavior every behavior that we engage in on a regular basis has a function. And we know that in order for any behavior to be maintained, to do it again and again and again, it has to have something that reinforces it. Otherwise, why would we do it? And I know your brain may reject that immediately and go, no, well, you know, my child is doing things like flapping their hands. Well, there's something about that that is reinforcing to them. And if we take the emotion out of it, I literally call it an emotional divorce, and look at the behavior, we're going to see patterns. And from those patterns, we can start to look and guess at what the function of the behavior is. And I want to be clear that for us, as lay people who do not have the background, we're going to be guessing. Um, now, in some cases, eh, you know, if it's not that challenging, you may have the time to guess, and it may be of interest to you to guess, but there are some things that if our child engages in, it puts them in danger. Uh, literally, physically, health-wise, it puts them in danger. It puts somebody else in danger. And there are all kinds of ramifications. We see children all the time who have the mental capacity to be included in a typical class, but they have challenging behaviors that prevent them from being in that class because they cannot control themselves in a way that leaves everybody safe and able to access the curriculum. And we see children on a daily basis lose their setting and have to go to a more restrictive setting because of challenging behavior, not because of a lack of intellectual ability. This to me is a crying shame, right? Because if we can get that behavior under control, the child can be there and not only be learning what's in the curriculum, but learning from these other children who are behaving in a way that is, I hate to say it, but neurotypical. Um, so we always want to be targeting those behaviors. And I want to talk specifically about biting today. But I want to say from the beginning that if your child is biting on a regular basis, you really want to contact uh, somebody who can do a functional behavior assessment. It's called an FBA, a functional behavior assessment. And in most cases, that is going to be a licensed BCBA, board certified behavior analyst. Uh, there are other people who can do an FBA, but you especially want to make sure that it's somebody who has, if your child has autism, you want to say, you know, do you have experience with autism and do you have experience with this kind of biting? Um, don't, you know, the whole reason for getting somebody to do an FBA is that it's going to save your child time and it may save your child's life, right? So you don't want to turn this over to somebody who's just cutting their teeth and starting to work on autism. Don't let your child be the guinea pig. But there are plenty of BCBAs out there who have a great deal of experience with autism and in particular with biting. So uh, definitely ask about that. But while you're waiting to meet with the BCBA, uh, you want to save time and money and energy, right? So your assignment from me is to start looking at the behavior. Look at the behavior and take some notes on it. We always want to take data 
right? <laughs> it doesn't sound that exciting, right? But if it leads to changing the behavior quicker, it's very exciting. And it's data sounds like a difficult thing, but it's not. We're not going to be graphing, uh, you know, plot points and all that. What we're just going to do is create, we're going to take a sheet of paper and we're going to draw two lines on it, which creates three columns. And we're going to label those columns A, B, and C. The A is the antecedent. We've talked about this before. The B is the behavior. The C is the consequence. So, and you keep, you can fold it up and put it in your purse, put it in your pocket and uh, just be aware of it. So you're moving through your life and on Tuesday afternoon, you're at the grocery store and Beth, your child bites you while you're in the grocery store. You're moving through the aisle and she leans over and she bites you. Okay. Well, there's the behavior, right? So in the B column, you're going to fill that one out first and you may not do it while you're in the store because you got a child who's biting you, right? This is not the ideal time to fill this out. But at some point, as soon as you can, it may be when you get back in the car and she's strapped in her five point harness and you've got two free hands. Uh, you've turned on the car so the air conditioning is going so nobody's getting overheated and you're taking a moment for yourself because you've been bit. You, you're entitled to have some feelings about that, right? But channel it into this paper. So you write down, you know, it's two o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, we were, I was pushing the cart. Beth, well, don't even worry about that yet. Beth bit me. Um, and write down exactly what the behavior was. She leaned forward, she bit, she held on for two seconds, she left teeth marks, uh, she attempted to bite me again, whatever it was. So you're writing down what the, what the actual behavior was. Then you want to move on to the C column and you're going to say, what happened immediately afterwards? Did you yelp? Did you go, hey! Why did you do that? Did you react instinctively and defensively and slap her hand? Uh, did you bite her back? Which is what a lot of people, well, I'd certainly, you know, I've seen people that have done that. Don't, no judgments, right? But write down what the consequence was. Did you acknowledge it and say, you just bit me and mommy doesn't like that and we're leaving the store now? All that's consequence, whatever it is, no judgments. No, well, I should have done this or had I thought better of it if I wasn't so upset, right? We've all been there, right? <laughs> no judgments, but really write down what the consequence was. Now you've got the behavior and you've got the consequence. Now, think back. And this is the hardest part, and it's going to be the less, the least scientific about it because you were chopping and looking at the cereal in the aisle, right? Uh, or doing something else. You were distracted, maybe, or maybe you weren't. Maybe you guys were having a conversation about something. But you want to write down what happened right before right before you got bit. And you're just going to do your level best and you may not get this perfect, right? But you're going to write down and say, you know, I was walking along and I was look I picked up a cereal box and was looking at the ingredients on it and she leaned over and she bit me. Or I was talking to my neighbor who was standing there and she just leaned over and bit me. Or I had just taken, you know, she reached in my purse and took my pen or my phone and I took it away from her and she bit me, right? Whatever it was. And you may be completely stumped and say there was nothing there was nothing I was just walking along and she bit me if that's what it feels like write that down that's useful information and again you're not necessarily going to get it hundred percent right but it's useful information great now you have your A such as it is you got your B and you got your C the A is the antecedent what happens before the B is the behavior the C is the consequence for it um, and then and then you make a little line because this, and you mark down, this was Tuesday at two o'clock. Then you get around to Thursday and it's bath time and Beth bites you again. And she doesn't bite you on the arm now. She bites you on the cheek, uh, the chin, the jaw, whatever it is. Um, and you've got a child in the bath and you're thinking, oh no, the piece of paper is down on the dining room table. Uh, uh, you're not going to leave the child and go write down what happened right then, but you're going to wait until she's in bed and you've got a second and you write down, okay, it was around 7.30, I put her into the bath and she went to give me a hug and she bit me. Uh, so that's exactly what it was and you, uh, you write down the consequence for it. Did you push her back? Did you, you know, yell at her? What were the consequences for it? Uh, did she get sent to bed with no cookie? What happened, right? And then you 
go back to the antecedent and say, you know, I put her in the bath and she was hugging me, right. Uh, and what happens is that you start to keep a log of these different things. So when the BCBA comes, you, the BCBA is gonna ask you, when does this happen? If you've taken the time to write it down, it's gonna be more precise. You're going to save your child time, you're gonna save yourself money, and you're gonna save the BCBA time and effort because they're gonna do a better job of figuring out what the function is. I will tell you that there's four main suspects for challenging behavior. They're not the be all, end all. Sometimes there are other things, but usually four main suspects, right? One is attention, that our children will, and this is not just biting, this is most challenging behavior. Our, the payoff is that they got some attention for it. Now, here's the tricky part with this. Attention doesn't have to be positive, right? For some kids, well, let's face it, for some adults, if they get attention for something, even if it's being yelled at, there is something about it that is reinforcing. Don't try to explain that to yourself, right? Uh, just know that that is the case. So if the child bit and you yelled at them, it may be, may be that the attention is what they were looking for. Um, another suspect is that it gives them access to someone or something. Um, so if you had the, the rubber duck and you went to put her in the bath and she bit you and you just threw the toys in and said, fine, you know, and so she got access to the duck. Um, if it was in the store and you dropped the cereal box and she held the cereal box for a second, that could be reinforcing enough, okay? Uh, third suspect is that it is in some way reinforcing automatically. That what we see with biting sometimes is that the sensation of biting feels good. Uh, if you've ever teethed, I remember when my um, wisdom teeth were coming in, I needed to chew on things because it hurt. They itched. They literally, it, even though it was painful to bite on things, I, I, I went and got myself a rubber teething ring. That's why we give those things to kids as they're, they're teething because it feels better to bite on it. And for some of our kids, even after their teeth have come in, there maybe their teeth are buzzing or it just feels funny. There's something about it that's really reinforcing. Uh, so it could be that it just feels good. That's the hardest one to kick, by the way, but it's not impossible. And then, of course, the last one is escape, that there is something going on that they want to escape from. So it might be in the bath that you went to put her in the bath. She didn't want to go in the bath. You got the bite. You set her down to deal with and look in the mirror, and she got out of the bath for a minute, right? But it was reinforcing enough. So what needs to happen then is that the BCBA is going to piece together which one of those or which sometimes it's two of them together. Maybe it's attention and escape. Because uh, if I can get out of the bath and get mommy's attention, woohoo, right? Um, so the, uh, the, BCBA or whoever the person is is doing the FBA is going to interview you. You're going to give them your notes. It's going to make it quicker for them. They're then going to try to set up circumstances where they see the behavior. Uh, they're going to say, okay, you know, let's go to the grocery store and see if it happens again. Uh, you know, um, but they're going to devise for you a behavior intervention plan that is going to include a replacement behavior. So for instance, if it's attention, instead of your child having to bite you for attention, they are going to give that child, they're gonna teach you and teach the child how to appropriately gain your attention so that they don't have to bite. Um, and they're going to manipulate antecedents and consequences so that there is no reward. So if your child, if you mess up, up and one antecedent modification is to make sure that when your child is in a circumstance where they're likely to bite, that your hand or arm or cheek or whatever it is that's being bitten isn't in a place where they can access it, but sometimes you mess up. And if you were to leave your hand in a place where they could bite you and it was atten attention driven, you would not give the attention. Uh, you would focus on something else. You wouldn't yelp. It's hard. It's really, really hard. Been there, done that. But what happens is when they, when you found the right function and you cut off the supply of the reinforcement, it goes away. 
it really does because it doesn't serve a purpose anymore. Um, so there's always a replacement behavior that gets the job done without the challenging behavior and the antecedent and sometimes consequences, one or the other, or sometimes both, will be manipulated so that in some cases it's that the child doesn't get the reinforcement for it or we make it really not necessary for the challenging behavior to happen if we can change the antecedent. Um, really specific a behavior intervention plan that says here's what we do so that the behavior can't happen here's what we're doing instead of the behavior and here's what we do if the behavior behavior ends up happening anyway um, but biting can stop I know that there are so many of you out there that are being bitten by your child or your child is biting the other children or your child is biting the dog or your child is biting the furniture or the toys or something. It does not have to be. It does not have to be. But please, you have to ask for help. Um, and if you're having difficulty finding the help, write to us. We'll help to connect you with people in your area who are knowledgeable about these things. And if it's that you can't afford that, please write and tell me that so we can help you to find a funding source so that you, I, you know, I got bit a few times. My thing was that I got punched in the head and that changed too. But I, I knew one mom in particular that could not wear something sleeveless because her arm was constantly being bit. And it was a shame thing for her that she felt that she wasn't parenting properly. And that's not the case. She didn't have the toolkit and she didn't understand her child's behavior. But I can tell you that that all changed for her and her child has not bit in years and she wears sleeveless shirts again. Uh, it does not have to be. So get the help. You know, it's time, we're past the time. Look at how long I've gone over. Uh, it's time for us to talk about the A word. By the way, on the A word, uh, the little boy just went through a biting phase and you can watch how they figured out what the function of that was and how they changed that behavior and how he's not biting anymore uh, by watching past episodes. But we're going to watch a new episode right now. This is a documentary that's being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I just love this. It's about a little boy, Jack Riley, real family. They, uh, it's an ongoing documentary. They drop in uh, and visit with him on a weekly basis. He was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He's about to turn three at where we are in the series. And he's been having ABA therapy for about six months. And there's a tremendous amount of progress. Is he done? No, because this is a long haul, right? But he is talking in complete sentences. He is engaging with people. He is as interested in people, if not more, than objects now, which was not the case. And he is having a really good time. But that doesn't mean that it's always easy. So let's drop, drop in on Jack Riley and see what's going on with him this week. This is The A Word. Do you think Jack knows what's happening today? Not a clue. We ask him where the baby was, and sometimes he points here, and sometimes he just points here and says belly button. <laughs> so he's either getting a baby sister or a belly button. He's not sure. <laughs> Is she paid gun? Is she stitches? It's a wrister, yeah. Another one? What potion? The hot potion. Sure, which one do you want? Oh. Okay, here you go. Jessica gave Jack Riley a partial vocal prompt to get him to ask instead of demand the puzzle from her. Last week she had to prompt him by saying, Say, Can I? Hi, Kitana. Sure. But now she only makes the sound to get him to ask. Eventually, he will need no prompting. Case. Case? Yes, I want case. Okay. Yeah, case. Yes, you can. There you go. Should we dance and sing? Should we sing head, shoulders, knees, and toes? Ready? Yeah? Okay, let's sing the song first, though. Sing, sing song first. Ready? Head. Sing first, and then Dumbo. Sing first. Now that Jack Riley has language, he negotiates with Jessica instead of tantruming or crying like he would have. Eyes and ears and mouth and mouth. head. Shoulders, knees, and toes. Whoa! I uh, have one eight there. <laughs> yeah, you finished the song. Okay, come here. Whee! Whoa! It's like you're Superman, huh? It's like you're Superman. Come here. Uh-uh. Jack Riley. 
Riley, come here. Are you excited? Are you excited? He's sleeping. Are you sleeping? <laughs> so what time are you going to leave, Mike? Uh, we're going to, well, we have OT at 11. Oh, you still have OT today? Yeah. Wow. Is it going to get closed? Yeah, well, that's the life of a, you know, that's our life now. Let's go back out. I'm going to go, uh, get I'm going to take a shower because we're going to have a baby. <laughs> See you later. Later. <laughs> Welcome back. That was the A word. And we try to show one episode each week and I kind of pick it apart and, um, and go, did you see this? And did you see that? Because I really love it. But I really want to remind you that you can be watching the entire series in its entirety on the, their YouTube channel, which Emily is putting up there for you on the screen. Uh, I, I should be saying, because I know some of you are going to start be listening in podcasts, so it's youtube.com slash the A Word Autism. So you can go to YouTube, go to the A Word Autism. And... Uh, you can watch from the very beginning to see the progress. What I really love about this is that you begin to see the arc of ABA therapy and what it takes and how our kids acquire these skills and the different steps along the way. Because uh, we tend to think of things, I don't know, it's a weird thing. When you have a child with autism and skills don't come along when they're supposed to, uh, and then your child starts to gain skills, I think there's a little bit of a, a, a thing in your head where you go, okay, well, we're just gonna be there and then we'll have no issues ever again. But what happens is that your child starts to gain skills. So your child's still a little behind in some ways, but they're catching up. And what happens with progress is that they're then able to communicate their needs and you start to have problems that people have with their typical kids um, and we forget sometimes that it isn't all hearts and flowers and roses with typical kids that typical kids have tantrums and meltdowns too right um, or they get frustrated because you know don't we all want to do things our way and our kids do too and that they have frustration that they have feelings about that so it is it isn't as if it all is just uh this oh we get that taken care of we fill in the skills and then nothing ever goes wrong ever again right it is a process and then you know i know a lot of people that they they got their kids to a certain point and then the teenage years come and they go it's like the rules changed well the truth is is that our as our kids are progressing the rules are always changing for our kids and they're always pushing the envelope to see where they can push us to and where that what they can get right um so okay let's start from the beginning with that partial vocal prompt the prompt is the thing that we do to help them right so if i'm trying to get the child to say thank you i might say what do you say that's a prompt right we've all heard that done that um and 
so we prompt typical kids too but for our kids with autism we're going to do a lot more prompting and maybe in the beginning we say say thank you right and eventually we get into we say say th so we're prompting that's a partial prompt i'm not saying say thank you i'm saying th or some and eventually i might just go thank you or it might be an eyebrow that's a prompt too uh or i can say what do you say because i know that they already know to say thank you and eventually by the time they're 35 <laughs> We hope that they say thank you without us. Don't you know? That's a proud, proud day for any parent, but especially for a parent of a child on the spectrum. When somebody hands them something and they say thank you with no prompt whatsoever, woohoo! Right? But it doesn't happen overnight for anybody's child. That has to be said for a couple of years. Um, but we see that she's partially prompting him uh, that they started out with, this is where I talk about the arc. They started out with Jack Riley that with just a coex where they would get him to say buh and kuh and those kinds of things. And then eventually he started saying one word. So they started with something really reinforcing and they would kind of, you know, tempt him, not tease him, but tempt him with it and show it to him and he would reach for it and they, you know, so if he wanted the ball and they'd put it behind their back and say, say ball, and he would say, buh, right? Approximation, yay, you get the ball because you asked for it. And then they'd get out a plate of cookies and he would reach for one and they would uh, they would hold up the cookie to him and say cookie and he'd go, oh, approximation, yay, he got reinforced for it. And they would keep working on the c c c so eventually he could say cookie. We saw last week that his, his diction is so much better because they've been working on it in so many different ways. But that requesting something and getting it, that's called manding. And originally, he just had to get close to saying a syllable and he got reinforced it. And then you move the goalpost further away. So it's two syllables. Now he has to say cookie, right? Okay, yay! And then eventually he had to say two words. So he had to say more cookie. And maybe he signed it too, but more cookie or cookie please or one cookie right and then he had to say I want a cookie so then we got into a full sentence now we don't want him to just go through life and only know how to say I want cookie right so they're teaching him different manned frames these are different ways of saying something when you're asking for something so he knows I want cookie or I want more cookie and now he's learning can I have a cookie so they were teaching that to him last week and now Jessica is prompting him and we're only going to teach it one thing at a time that's DTT right so they're not teaching him all of them at the same time but eventually they will put them all together uh, and he'll start to put them all together but uh, you know she's kind of tempting him with something and he says you know want such and such and she says K now instead of saying can I she's saying K and he goes can I because he knows I say that and they're gonna give it to me that's DTT right there I say this you do this you get that woohoo we're teaching um, now you know they bring up in this week's episode that he's negotiating with her that uh, he she he wants something and she says okay we have to sing first and we do this a lot with our kids this is a way we make things harder and harder and they learn more and more skills that we ha we know something that he already said what he wanted right we don't do this in the beginning in the beginning when we're teaching manding they ask for something we give it to them right but over time as the child builds more skills we're gonna make Make things more difficult so the child has asked for something we say okay you can have that but first we're going to right so we're teaching a lot of different things there we're teaching flexibility we're teaching language we're teaching waiting we're teaching transitioning uh, all of these things come under the heading of negotiating now you notice that the and they the uh, voiceover says before he just would have tantrumed right he wouldn't have been ready for this but now he has enough words that he can he says I want and I don't remember what it is that he I want you know and she says well we're gonna sing first well I want and she says well, we're gonna sing first right it's a little bit back and forth but eventually he sees she means business and they do the song and he gets reinforced for doing the song and he gets the thing great um, but whereas last week the last couple of weeks he's been in this really great mood and so happy um, to be working on something and so agreeable and being very people centric he's having an off day right he's I don't want to do what you asked me to do well don't we all have those days this is not unusual this is not 
autism coming back, right? I always used to worry about that. I'd be like, oh no, we had all this progress and where did it go? It's back. Um, in my head, that's where I'd be. It's this is personality. This is people. We all want to have things our way. And some days we're like happy to be along for the ride. And other days we're like, well, even though I kind of want to do that because you asked me to do it, I don't want to do it. I'm feeling belligerent. I was still about, uh, having, I was in a bad mood one day and I had my shopping cart and I was in a hardware store parking lot. And, uh, there was a sign in the parking lot that said, return your carts here. And there was no please or anything. It was just return your cards here. And I was in such a bad mood that I literally walked up to the sign and said, and what if I don't feel like it? Uh, and that's when I knew I was in a really bad mood. I don't usually talk to signs. Um, but you know, we all get in that kind of mode sometimes and our kids will too. So he's in a mood, he's in a snit. And she, there are some things where she's not pushing the envelope with him, right? Because you don't want to push and push and push and push, right? You really got it. This is where you get into feeling it out with your gut. She doesn't want to push and push and push, but she can't let him get away with not doing something. And she brings up the all important follow through, right? And we have Evelyn Gould on, on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock and she's brilliant about talking about some days you have a yes day and some days you have a no day. And it's really important to know where you are and where your child is because you don't want to just get into a push thing, right? That doesn't behoove anybody. And so you have to know before you start something, do you have the wherewithal to back it up? As my sister likes to say, don't write checks your body can't cash. <laughs> Right? Um, you know, don't start something that you can't follow through on. And if you're saying to the child, okay, well, you need to put on your shoes um, and you need to do it yourself, then you need to follow through on that. We can't just go, okay, well, you don't have to. It's the hardest thing as a parent, knowing when to start something, when not to, and to follow through when, because you have to have compliance, right? And again, we go back to with compliance, it's really important that if you have to, if you have to gain compliance, you've got to make it rewarding, right? They have to, it has to be clear that it's worth their while to comply. And sometimes you have to go back another step and ask them to do something that you know that they already want to do to get compliance. Uh, I know I'm not the only parent who says this because I've had many times that sometimes it's like your child, you just go, I want to push the reset button. Why are you being so belligerent right now? Uh, you know, and you want to have that my son and I had a whole conversation yesterday about nagging. He's like, mom, you know, you're really annoying me. And I, t I gave him the word. I said, yes, mommy likes to nag and mommy's working on that. And I said, and you can tell me when I nag. And like four times yesterday, I'm trying to get him in bed because I was exhausted last night. And he, and he, and, and I said, okay, uh, you know, but you have to stop. And he's like, there it is. There's the nagging. And I was like, enough. Right? Not my finest parenting moment. We all get to that place. But I, I stepped back and said, I, you know, I am not the best person right now. So I'm not going to push the envelope. We're just going to go right back to basics. And I had to make it reinforcing for him to do the things that I needed him to do to get him in bed. <sighs> right? Um, follow through. Really important, but don't push it. If you're having a no day and they're having a no day, that's not the day to take on the things that are the most difficult. It just isn't. Um, but it is important that you follow through with anything you start. And then I love the end when the dad says, okay, well, you know, at 1030, we have OT and, and I don't know what the therapist says then, but the dad says, this is it. This is our new life. This is the life of a parent in this circumstance. Uh, because it is, it is. And you see, it's a little difficult. It's a lot difficult. It's a lot difficult. And it's a treadmill and it's overwhelming on some days and you just do the best you can on those days. But I will tell you one thing, this too shall pass. If you put in the time, um, this too, it's not this way forever. And I will be honest with you, when I was in the middle of it, I really didn't know that. And I needed somebody to tell me that on a daily basis. And there weren't, there wasn't anybody to tell me that on a daily basis, but you put in the time and this is not the rest of your life. I am still, we're a year out of intensive ABA and, and I, I go, well, when are we going to have to be, you know, we got to be here. We got to be there. And, um, we do for other things. 
just not for OT and not for therapy anymore. It's still a weird thing. I'm still adjusting to it a year later. But in any case, this dad, this will not be his circumstance forever. And he will have a child who's talking and negotiating and conveying what he thinks and what he feels, uh, which is a pretty amazing thing. Still hard still hard. I really encourage you to watch the A word. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Stick with us. We are coming back to talk about our viewer responses to today's question. Don't forget that at the top of the hour, we're having daddy blogger, Sean Colton's going to be with us. He is writing the book. I want to get it right. Legends of the Boo Monster. So stick with us. is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you.
Welcome back to Autism Live. And uh, it's time for us to talk about a language tip of the week. We've been talking about um, DTT was our uh, phrase of the day today, discrete trial teaching. And uh, we talked about encapsulating uh, a, a skill and making it so that it's a very clear antecedent behavior and consequence. It's called a three-term contingent. And um, we can do that with language on a regular basis, and it's a great way to teach language. And in particular, I want to talk today about teaching receptive language, because you guys know that and we'll hear people talking about our children constantly in terms of their receptive language abilities and their expressive language abilities. Remember that expressive goes this way. It isn't necessarily vocal speech. Sometimes it's signing, but it's our us communicating. When I'm expressing myself, that's my expressive language. Receptive is what you receive, so what you hear and receive, um, which again can be vocal or otherwise. And we want to build both of these skills in a child, right? But first we need to look and see where they are in terms of those abilities. Do we have a child who's very expressive with very low receptive skills? Do we have a child with huge receptive skills, very low expressive? Do we have a child who has neither, right? Um, if we have a strength to build on, we want to build on that strength, but we want to shore up wherever we're behind. Um, but really, I, it's as a parent and as a teacher, it's fascinating to see where your child is in these different abilities. And I think that a lot of people assume that if a child is not expressing themselves a lot, that there is no receptive, and quite frankly, that's often wrong. Um, but for some of our kids, they have difficulty with receptive language. And we want to be very very specific when we're teaching recept receptive language and we don't want to muddy the water at all. I love, uh, as I mentioned, Evelyn Gould comes in. She's a BCBA. She comes on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time here. And one of the things that she talked about a couple of months ago is comparing if we were going to, as adults, learn a new language. And she said, imagine that you go to Russia, Shannon, which sounds like a great thing for me. I love ma imagining me in Russia. And she said, and you're staying at this bed and, bread and breakfast, and uh, the, the woman who is the, the innkeeper comes up to your room and is standing in the bedroom with you, and she's speaking in a rush of Russian. You speak no Russian whatsoever, and she's saying all of these things to you. You have no idea what she's talking about. You're frustrated. She's frustrated. Nobody has any idea what's being said. And expect that you're going to try to learn Russian in these circumstances. Well, it's going to be an uphill climb. But she said, imagine that the woman came upstairs and gestured to you and grabbed your hand and brought you downstairs uh, to the dining room. And there's a bowl of soup there on the table. And the woman points to the soup and she says one word and uh, and mimes you eating, then you understand, oh, whatever this one word is, and I don't know what the Russian word for eat is, but you begin to understand that it means probably eat, right? It's possible that it means soup, right? <laughs> But you know that the word means either eat or soup. And in the next circumstance that you're someplace and you want to eat and you say the word, which you've now heard and have linked it up with these things, you know, you're going to get fed something. If soup comes, you start to say, okay, well, this must be soup. This word means soup. Or if they bring you a sandwich, you know, okay, this word means eat uh, or food or something like, you know, you're narrowing it, narrowing it down. But you're going to start using this word and expressing yourself with this word and pick up Russian much faster. And the next time somebody says this word to you, if you're hungry, you're gonna react favorably, right? You're going to start to gain a knowledge of what that word means. It's not gonna be the be all end all in the first time, but you're gaining knowledge of it. We need to be this specific with our children. Imagine a child who it, for them, it's a second language. It's a first language. There's language happening all around them and they can't make heads or tails of it. And you're standing there and saying, okay, I want you to be a good boy and do this, and, you know, wah, bah, bah, wah, bah, bah, wah, bah, bah, right? <laughs> Just like on uh, Charlie Brown. It, it's not going, we're not going to get our kids caught up in that way. We just aren't. 
Um, so we have to go back to basics and really pare down and be specific. So we want to try to use as few words as possible. I know you feel like your child is behind and you want to bombard them with language, but go back to the example of being in Russia. If you were bombarded with Russian, eventually you're going to pick up some things, but how much faster are you going to learn it if you get it in, in very specific all the time. Bombard your child with opportunities for language, but very specific ones. So, you know, if you're holding the ball, you're saying ball. You're not saying this is a ball that's blue. Ugh, too many words to figure out. You're not saying please sit down because I need to talk to you. You're saying sit, <laughs> right? Uh, you're not saying it's time to go to bed um, because you have to be up early in the morning, not with a child that's acquiring language. You're saying bedtime, right? And that's it. Or just bed or night night, right? Um, keep it succinct and to the point and your child will start to pick up at least the receptive understanding of those words and very often uh, they'll pick up the expressive of it that much quicker if we are succinct. Now the problem becomes if you're like me I want to say a lot of words um, and it really takes a great deal of restraint and it doesn't have to be that way for a long period of time. But again, this is when we're building language and building receptive. So being clear and succinct, as edit, edit down as few words as possible. And this is how we give our children the gift of language. So always think of learning Russian. And this is how you're gonna teach your child uh, receptive language. It's a fabulous thing. All right, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're taking on the myth of the day. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that. Stick with us. I'm Adele Nadowski, director and co-creator of Skills. Card eLearning is an online tool that has been developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Card eLearning is the training that is delivered to the ABA therapists at CARD to train them on the principles of applied behavior analysis and to equip them with the knowledge they need to essentially deliver the ABA-based techniques during their therapy with the children that they work with. ABA has been proven scientifically to be the most effective intervention for children with autism. At this point, even the Surgeon General has come out with a statement suggesting just that. So we know that this is something that children with autism definitely need if they're going to improve and um, live the lives that we're hoping that they're going to be able to live. By being able to train people on this one particular method that we know works and to be able to have all of your staff within your school settings on the same page, it allows you to take more of a multidisciplinary approach and there's definite consistency going on within the team. It makes sure that every person involved with that child's treatment program, including the speech and language pathologist, the occupational therapist, the teachers, the aides, all of these individuals to be able to be trained so that they can all work together effectively with the child. Parents that are using CARD eLearning can use it either to train themselves and then after having done that they can implement uh, different techniques with their child in order to teach new skills. Um, but oftentimes parents might also be working either with an ABA provider, with a school, or they may have even hired their own therapist to deliver the intervention techniques. So CARD eLearning can be used um, either to collaborate with your school, it can also be used to train the therapists that are coming to the home of the parents, uh, or it can also be shared with the ABA provider so that that provider can find out about it and perhaps implement it within their organization and train their staff. You can also do um, reporting for your organization. So you can actually look and find out which teachers are progressing, what their quiz scores are, and actually we can give you reports as well that will help you to compare the different teachers and their performances. 
Card e-learning is really, really simple to use. You can log on to this as long as you have a computer, that's all you need, and an internet connection. And you can work on it any time of the day, anywhere that you're at. When you log on, you realize that right away. First of all, um, on the top of the page, there's a navigational tutorial. It's a how to use this page button. Simply by watching that video, it'll all kind of unfold in front of you, and it becomes extremely self-explanatory. Um, Cardi Learning has nine modules, and you can basically go through those at your own pace. Um, you're going to be watching videos that are kind of like um, a storyboard with narration, but in addition to that, there's many different video clips of therapists actually implementing the techniques that are being described within the storyboard that you can also watch. And then of course you're able to pause, you're able to type notes right directly underneath the video that you're watching. You can save your notes, you can review them, and um, between each module you do take a quiz. And once you pass that quiz you can go on to the next module. And then after you complete all of them, you have a final exam. And by completing the final exam and passing with a score of 85% or better, you will be given a certificate of completion. Let me show you how easy it is to use Cardi Learning. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Do you not love our myth of the day? This is... Uh... <laughs> No, homage in part to my son who loves Star Wars and loves space. Um, and, you know, we, t we talk about myths from time to time on the show because I do think it's, it's a part of this journey that there is misinformation that is out there. And sometimes it's misinformation that we have to let people know so that our children get the proper education and, and get the proper treatment from people that as they move through their world. And sometimes it's important important that we say things again and again and again because there are people uh, in our community who don't have the full knowledge of some of the things that are going on. It's very, you know, if you don't know the question to ask or you haven't seen something, um, it's easy to not know. I always say to people, if I don't know, then I don't even know to ask the question. Um, and I know that's true for all of us. So I, I know this is a, a myth that we've talked about before, but it's important to me that we talk about it on a regular basis. That how do I even uh, approach this? Uh, what I want to say is, uh, the, uh, I want to talk about the word recovery. And I know it's an emotional issue. I could just feel the tension go up. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I, I want to talk about what what is and what's possible. And we know that there's a diagnosis for autism. And we know that a lot of our children fall in different places on that spectrum and that if they are given the right amount of ABA therapy over the right amount of time, it's been demonstrated in over a hundred studies that if that happens for a child and it started early enough, that statistics are going to show us that a large portion, we're talking around 47% of those kids will at some point in their life no longer qualify for an autism spectrum diagnosis. They just don't. And that's the reality. Now, um, I, there are people who call that recovery. Uh, there are people who call it other things. I don't know that the word necessarily matters to anyone other than the individual. Um, but I want you to know that that is the reality, that there comes a time when children no longer qualify for the diagnosis having been diagnosed before. It is not that they outgrew it. I'm sorry, that just is not the case. It is, uh, it is not, you know, for me, in terms of what the word cure means, it is not a cure, but they no longer qualify for that diagnosis. The word that I use on the show here is recovery um, because it's the word that makes the most sense to me. If that particular word is off-putting to you, please know I completely accept that, but I want you to know that they can work and gain skills to the point where they don't qualify for the diagnosis, where they are virtually indistinguishable from their peers that developed typically. How exciting is that? Now I have to step back for a second and remind you that that is not going to be the case for all of our children. 
That's a big deep breath, right? But even the children who don't get to recovery or being virtually indistinguishable can make huge progress, substantive progress. I know there are lots of people in the media who poo poo and say, well, ABA is expensive, it's time consuming, it requires a lot of resources, and it isn't necessarily for every child because all of those children aren't going to recover. Well, okay, I would agree with you that all of our children are not going to recover. All of our children are not going to lose their diagnoses. But I, as a mother, am in a position where if we can get a child to be potty trained, I, I can't imagine how anybody could say that that isn't worthwhile, right? And in all the studies that have been done, it usually comes down to that there are three categories of children. If they get the proper amount of ABA for the proper amount of time, that you're going to see a group around 47% of the kids who are going to get to the point where they're virtually indistinguishable from their peers. All right, that's a party. That's exciting. That's wonderful. That to me is a high enough number that we should all get behind ABA to begin with. But then what about those other 53% of the kids? Well, a large portion of those kids make such tremendous progress that maybe they're not virtually indistinguishable from their peers, but they're leading a full life that is largely unhampered by the diagnosis. By the way, that's my child. I talk all the time about how well my child is doing. He is not in that 47% of children who have recovered. He's in that middle group. The kids who've made such substantive progress, but he's not virtually indistinguishable from neurotypical peers. Uh, I, he continues to work towards that, and I fully expect that someday I'm going to sit here and tell you that, no, he doesn't qualify for his diagnosis anymore, and he and needs no additional support services, and he's virtually indistinguishable. But he's nine, and we are not there yet. And you know what? He's wonderful. He has already picked out his office at NASA, and I have no doubt believing that he will be in that office working at some point on the payroll. He knows that he wants to go to college, and he, we have conversations. My child is potty trained. He has friends. He is excited about the things in his life. He's interested in people and things. We'll sit and tell you that math is his favorite subject, right? Uh, this is a good life, this middle category. And anybody who tries to tell me, well, maybe those kids shouldn't get it because they're not going to get to recovery, boy, you got to fight from me, right? Over my dead body is what I like to say to people because we're not throwing our kids away. They're worth it. And that progress, I can promise you, if your child is in that category, it's worth it. Now let's talk about the other category, which is by far the minority. The kids who don't make the progress to the point where they're included in class, uh, neurotypical class, the kids who uh, are still struggling and still hampered by things on their diagnosis, with their diagnosis. I would tell you that the vast majority of those children are children who are uh, twice exceptional. They have other things besides autism, although I will tell you that some of those kids get in the second category too. But they have other uh, medically diagnosed issues going on for them as well, and still those kids make progress. Those kids have progress, especially in the adaptive area, that they get toilet trained, that they have functional communication skills, uh, that they are able to function at a much higher level than where they were. And that's the spectrum you're left with if those children get the proper amount of ABA, quality ABA, over the right amount of time. I can't think of anybody on that spectrum that it wouldn't be worth it, that it wouldn't be worth it for the child, for their quality of life, and for their parents. So I don't want for you to be put off by the term recovery, but I don't want you to be left out of the conversation of this much progress. And yes, most of the studies that have been done have been early interventions, starting with kids between the ages of three and five, and giving them between 25 and 40 hours of ABA, quality ABA therapy a week. And I know the heartbreak of so many of you that you're writing it and saying, oh my goodness, but my child is not eight or nine or 12. Is it too late for us? And what I have to to say to you is the studies aren't there to show you the breakdowns, but we do know on individual cases that kids are still making tremendous progress.
still making tremendous, there is no such thing as too late. Um, you know, and you are where you are. There's a certain amount of acceptance of, okay, I wish, you know, and we all have this at some, at some degree that we think, oh, if I had it to do over again, I would have started earlier. I would have done this. I wouldn't have done that. I would have, you know, uh, and I would ask you to put that to the side as much as you possibly can and get back into the business of getting your child all the help that you can right now. Uh, when would now be a good time? Now. And, you know, when your mind starts to go down that dark path of, well, coulda, woulda, shoulda, acknowledge it for yourself and say, but I didn't know. And so that's as much time as I'm going to spend on that. And instead, I'm going to find a way to get as much as I can right now. And if you need help finding that path, please use us. Uh, write in and say, this is where I'm at. This is the state that I'm in. Uh, this is where my child's at. I, you know, I want to start an ABA program. How am I going to go about this? And we'll help you to sort it out. Um, but recovery is possible. I see it on a regular basis. Uh, I want to be clear that the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, when they talk about the word recovery, what they're referring to is that the child no longer qualifies, has been taken to uh, a, a new person who has never seen them before and did not diagnose them with autism. They have no additional support services uh, at school or at home and are functioning at a C or above in a neurotypical class. Um, and are totally functional, virtually indistinguishable from their peers, um, that that's their definition of recovered. I like to refer to my son as recovering because we have not arrived yet, but we are still moving in that direction. There is hope. And that's the message that I want to spread. I, so many times I'll go to an event and somebody, the word recovery will come up and people go, oh, that's not possible, but it is. It is. So stick around, be a part of the conversation because recovery is possible, but progress is absolutely guaranteed for all of our kids. And that is where the hope is. We're going to take a break. Stick with us. We're going to come back and do the viewer response to today's question. When Maddie was diagnosed, I'll be honest, I was very ignorant on what autism was. I knew that autism was basically something that hit boys at the age of two to three and shut down. And sometimes you think of the typical Rain Man uh, movie. Um, and with Maddie, she was doing all the same signs and symptoms of a, of a typical child with autism spectrum disorder. Stand up. She didn't even acknowledge us coming into the room. Um, she had barely any eye contact. Um, she didn't interact with her sister. She didn't really do anything. She just basically lined up her toys and that was about it. We have a team of seven volunteers, or, or eight now, eight volunteers, including my husband and I. And I'm the team leader, and so I do all the curriculum and get everything ready each week. Jana was downstairs until 11 o'clock at night working on curriculum, going through two different textbooks. And then we, as a group, meet on Monday nights, and we would go through what the curriculum was from Jana. And a lot of times we would go, well, how exactly do you do that? How do you sit her at the table and, and do this trial base? Well, what skills has done for us, it's, it's taken that away from Jana trying to figure out the curriculum for one, she can go down, or on our, even our laptop, and she can sit down and through all these questions, it comes up with the different programs. At least for me, it was a relief off my shoulders. I was worried that I might be missing something, um, missing a curriculum that maybe she needs to know, where the skills, they have every, every possible thing your child needs to know from zero to seven. They have a program for that. What noise is this? <laughs> Every program that we did with her, I knew it was specific for what she needed to learn. Because before skills, it was a lot of, okay, well, is that really age appropriate for a two-year-old? You know, because it's not generalized. It's anywhere from zero to seven. This is what your child needs to know in most, in most manuals you'll find. Um, 
But for this, okay, yep, yeah, she should be learning this. And no, she's not four yet. She doesn't need to know that yet. We are so fortunate that Jana was able to attend a conference put on by CARD that opened the door for skills and that um, there's no looking back for us. We started using the program in November. It seemed like by January something just clicked and she has completely kind of came out of her fog that she was in for quite a while. I have never read a documented case on any child that has not benefited anything from applied behavior analysis and uh, now with this new skills and being, you know, like the E version of ABA, I can't imagine it doing anything harmful to their child. It, it's nothing but exponential growth for us. To see her now, it, is, it just blows us away I and mean, we call her our little miracle child because um, in seven months time, she has just blossomed into this normal functioning child and suddenly, we joke about it all the time, like suddenly we have twins. If you're even thinking about doing it, do it. Because the absolute worst thing you can do is do nothing at all. And even if you use this program and it's just a single mom or a single dad working in the evenings with their child, this program is going to benefit them. It's, it's going to show you where they are, it's going to show you where they need to go, and it's going to show you what skills and how to get there. It is an online book on how to help recover your child. Welcome back to Autism Live. I, I just have to say that, you know, we talk about autism votes a lot on this show, and I just want to do a shout out to everyone that everyone should check. Everyone should check and see if they're registered to vote, no matter what you decide that you want to vote for, but everyone needs to be registered to vote because, as I was just saying, that people have fought and died for all of us to have the right to vote. It's so important. Uh, there is Autism Votes. Uh, let your voice be heard, whatever it is that you want to say, and I very much believe in a society in which everybody gets to have their opinion, um, but don't just have an opinion, exercise it. Uh, now is a great time to register to vote because uh, there are some elections that are still going on and some primaries. We just did our primary here in California. Um, I know everybody feels like, oh, it's all said and done, but there are other things being voted on. And of course, there is a huge election happening in November. So register to vote. And then you can complain all you want when it doesn't go your way, but at least you've registered to vote. And then, of course, I, we will remind you to vote. But Autism Vote's a wonderful place to get good information, too. Okay, we had a question of the day today, and it was, uh, what do you wish your child's teacher knew about your child? We didn't get the question up until very recently, because uh, we've got a lot of things going on here today. But uh, some of you wrote in, and I want to talk, take just a couple of minutes to talk about that, although I want to remind you that after this, we're going to take a short break and we're going to be joined by and I've lost my little post-it, uh, Sean Colton, who is writing the book Legends of the Boo, uh, the Boo Monster, excuse, I was starting to say the Boo Meister, and uh, he is also a daddy blogger. So we're going to be talking to him via Skype in just a couple of minutes. You're going to want to stick around for that. But uh, I love these responses that you guys sent about what you wish your teacher knew about your, uh, your child. Uh, somebody wrote in and said, he's a great kid. Get to know him, not judge him and that's kind of along the same lines of what I said that you know don't just see a diagnosis see a person and get to know him and how he works and how he functions uh, another person who wrote in said that when he says something over and over he's frustrated not doing it to annoy the class and I think that goes under and there are many of you that wrote in about different individual behaviors and to have some acceptance and some compassion for some individual behaviors um, and that if we all, ourselves included, get to the point where we're looking at these things as behavior, and when we see a behavior happen over and over and over again, then we really have to ask ourselves, what's the payoff? What's the payoff? And somebody else wrote in and says, you know, my son asks the same question over and over and over again. And I had a person recently that wrote to me and said, you know, I don't know why, but all of a sudden, you know, my child is getting into this rut where he'll say something and I answer, like he'll ask a question, I answer it and he says it again and I answer 
the question. He says it again. And, you know, what's going on with this? And why is my child doing this? Because it literally drives me buggy. And we certainly have that circumstance happen with our son from time to time. And all children are different and realize that there are lots of different reasons why a child will ask something over and over and over again. And I can't presume to know for your child why your individual child is doing it, but I would love it if we all take that emotional divorce, look at it and go, okay, what's the payoff here? And for my son, sometimes when he is in a state where he's uncomfortable, he has learned to say things to let people know that, you know, something is happening that he would like to change. Like in particular, he'll say, I'm hungry, right? And so he'll say that to me and I might say to him, okay, I'm cooking dinner and it's going to be ready in five minutes, right? And 30 seconds will go by and my son will say, I'm hungry again. And I say, dude, you know, look at mommy. I just told you, uh, did you hear what I told you? No. What did you say? I said, I'm cooking dinner and it's going to be ready in five minutes. And he'll go, okay. And then five seconds later, he goes, I'm hungry. And that's when I got to take a step back and go, okay, what he's really telling me is I'm uncomfortable and I want my state to change and I want you to do something about it. And I want it to be immediate, right? Um, And sometimes what I have to do to kind of get him out of that little rut for my individual child is that I say to him, instead, I put the impetus of solving it back on him, which is where he needs to be anyway in terms of this age. Um, So after I've said it twice and said, okay, I'm cooking dinner and required eye contact so that I see that he's not just distracted and not listening to the answer, then I say to him, when he says it to me another time, he says, I'm hungry, then I'll say to him, okay, so what should we do about that? And then there's like this shift and I see him go, oh, okay, wait a second. And I remember you saying something before, uh, right, what, what should I do about it? And then we problem solve and we take it to another level. Um, and so sometimes when our kids say something over and over again, there's a lot more going on there, a lot more going on then. Um, and, and we can look at it. Now, that's my individual child. It's different for your child, I'm sure. But take a look at it and say, when is this happening? What's happening? What, what do I really think is underlying asking the question over and over and over again? Because it can make you batty, right? It can make us frustrated. We're like, why are you asking me that again? Uh, and something that I also do with him past a certain point is that I'll say to him, I'll say, asked and answered. Um, and that's just my, you know, letting you know that you've asked me this 10 times and that I'm not going to answer it anymore, that I don't get into that, you know, just ongoing frustration. Okay. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more viewer responses, uh, that we'll deal with later on, but we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by daddy blogger, Sean Colton. He is writing the book legends of the boo monster. And we're going to talk to him about that. Uh, and what he writes about and about being a dad. So stick with us. We're going to be back with him in just a couple of minutes. Sean Colton, who's writing an amazing series called The Boo Monster, based on his son David, who is um, autistic, but keeping it very much together, and uh, he's written a great character based on me called Sister Gemini, and we're trying to get this kick-started, so please donate some money to Sean, he's my uh, brother from Flint, Michigan, and um, he's brilliant and really making stuff happen, so... Join in and um, support Boo Monster. A boo! Hi, I'm Jane Monheit, a musician, 
And over the last year or so, through the magic of Twitter, I've been lucky enough to become friends with a very interesting and special person named Sean Colton. Now, I'm here speaking for Sean's Kickstarter campaign because I think his idea is a really beautiful one. Sean is a parent, as am I, so we have a lot in common, but things are a little bit different for Sean because his son David has autism. Now, Sean is writing a book called Legends of the Boo Monster, as David is affectionately called, to sort of uh, help other parents and kids and really anyone understand their relationship and autism and how it affects it in a, in a different way. It's a fantasy novel. It's a beautiful, magical ride, and this I know because I've been able to read some of the chapters as they've been written. It's, it's just the loveliest story, and the thing is, is what it's really about is the love between a father and a son, and how no matter what makes us different from each other as people, that love always stays the same. So, I really highly encourage you to support Sean's campaign to get this beautiful thing done and to quote the Boo Monster himself, a boo! Hi, I am Vanessa Ragland and I'm co-host of the Pop My Culture podcast, but more importantly, I am a friend and a fan of Sean Colton. Sean is an amazing guy, an amazing father, and he's putting together this wonderful project called Legends of the Boo Monster, and he's putting it together for the best reason ever, his son David. David has autism, and Sean is building a beautiful world just for David, and also to help other parents and kids that are going through this. And I am really flattered there's going to be a character inspired by me in there called the lovely Miss V. I don't know where he got the idea that I was lovely, but I will take it. Thank you, Sean. I just want to encourage everyone to help and get this project kickstarted because it's creative and it's fun and it has a lot of heart, and those are my three favorite things in the world. And then puppies are my fourth favorite thing. And then Zac Efron. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Legends of the Boo Monster. Do it. Support it. Be proud of yourself. Give yourself a pat on the back and give Sean a big hug. And in the words of the Boo Monster, Abu! Welcome back to Autism Live. We were just watching a video from Kickstarter for the book Legends of the Boom Monster. We're joined right now by Sean Colton, who is the author of this book. He is a dad, a daddy blogger. Sean, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit first about what, who is the Boo Monster? <laughs> Well, the Boo Monster originally was was my son David. That was sort of his nickname because he has catchphrases. He's he's non he, he's nonverbal, but he does have catchphrases, and one of them is Ah Boo. Ah. So we just started calling him the Boo Monster. And um, my friend David Hansen, who I named my son after, actually, um, I commissioned a piece of art from him where he would create fantasy versions of my whole family, my wife Pamela oh. and myself and David, and he came up with this character that just screamed to be written and uh I'm, i decided that i'm sorry no i was just gonna say i love that i love the idea of having your family and then having fantasy versions of each one of you what a wonderful wonderful idea well, yeah we, we so originally what i was going to do is i was just going to do a simple ebook where i i wrote about david in in reality mm -hmm. and then i decided i was going to go the route of writing a fantasy story where 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 people would be able to sort of understand a little bit more people with severe cognitive disorders mm -hmm. and um, in a way that 
in a way that was different from some of the things that we see in the media now, whether it's touch or, or um, Rain Man or all these other things where people sort of assume a certain level of, of, of almost super cognizance right. with these people that have this disability, whereas David's not, not at that level at all, and he's nonverbal. And he can't do very much for himself. And it's very difficult when we take him to the store or something or, you know, to the grocery store. He's, you know, for people to sort of grasp what's going on there. So you get this look of pity or disapproval or and I just want to put it out there that, you know, that this is and, and soon we're going to have a whole host of adults yeah. with these disorders. And uh, I don't I don't think people quite are ready for that yet. So I'm trying to do something that's sort of a little different, sort of make people understand, um, you know, severe cognitive disorders, so. Well, I gotta say, you know, I, I always say on the show, I have never met an autism parent that I haven't liked, and you're just f further proof of that, because I I think of what you have gone through, and, I, you know, I have, uh, your son is nine, my son is nine, and our paths have been vastly different because our kids always are. Right. I know how difficult it was for me, and I can only imagine how difficult it has been for you, and I look at what you have accomplished and I just think it's incredible I you know there are so many people who could have a child with a diagnosis and you're talking about being nine years old and it's still difficult to go to the grocery store and the fact that you are doing things and creating a world that's better for him and trying to help other people to understand as a way to prepare the world for him and other people like him it's just amazing it's really quite breathtaking and I have to say uh, congratulations because that's incredible <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, are are you aware of the fact that you're doing something really, really awesome? I think that what happened is when I started doing the daddy blog thing, and what I, what I tried to get across to people is that this is not some sort of nightmare. That when originally David was diagnosed, I went through a, a period of denial and um, fear. And I think that happens to, to everybody that gets yeah. that diagnosis for their child because you think to yourself, well, like, like you said earlier, is am I ever going to be able to have a conversation with my yeah. kid? And just the whole thought of that is, I mean, it's so sad to think that you might yeah. never really do that. Takes and um, David, it does. And David and I don't converse, but he and I have a communication form that is, it's almost volitionless. Mm. So it's almost hard to explain. Yeah. And that's another thing that I want to put in the book too is, the character of the Boo Monster, this this little monster, is no different than David in his behavior. So I'm not, it, it, I'm not changing his behaviorism uh, at all. Mm. So, um, what I'm trying to convey to people with with this, like I said, is that severe cognitive uh, disorders are. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. Okay. So. You know, but you're doing wonderfully. And, and I should mention, we were both voice only with Sean, uh, but we're showing some pictures of you with your son and showing pictures of the Boo My, uh, Boo. I, I keep wanting to say Meister, but it's Boo Monster. Um, the Boo Meister. And, yeah, the Boo Meister. I like it. Should have made it. Uh, no, I like the Boo Monster, but I, I don't know why. I just keep wanting to say Boo Meister. Uh, but they're, they're lovely, lovely pictures that we're looking at as uh, and lovely illustrations, too. And you did not do the illustrations. You had somebody do those, correct? Uh, yeah, that's uh, my friend David Hansen. Uh, he goes by the, uh, the uh, pseudonym Rags Dandelion. <laughs> Okay. But I did not name my son Rags. <laughs> I named my son David after. Well, uh, I'm I'm happy for you, and and probably uh, everybody is happy that you yeah, named him. Anybody? Well, yeah. The yeah. pictures are beautiful, though. I know they're. I, I think that. Um. I, I think that there's. It's a, It's another reason why. I mean, the artwork really spoke to me in a way that, you know, I just. I, I just felt like, I didn't really have, you know, I've always, I've always felt like I, I was able to tell a story. I didn't really find my voice until, you know, I, I had a child that couldn't speak at all. Mm. And I think I found my voice through him as a writer. So when I was writing the blog, I realized that, um, you know, I'd finally gotten this sort of weird niche going mm -hmm. where it was like he, he was really sort of, I was just channeling him in a way. So when I decided to do the book, the fantasy book, it just was easy for me to do. And I, I do it in the first person from the father monster's perspective uh -huh. because you can't really explain. I, I don't think you can do it in a story, you know, a typical storytelling fashion, explain 
sort of the behaviors of somebody like David or the Boo Monster for that matter. So, Well, and so the book, The Legends of the Boo Monster, you go back and forth between the fantasy world and the, and the reality. Is that the case? Yeah, what, what, I'm, what I originally was going to do, chapter, 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 back and forth, but I think I will do like five fantasy chapters, and then I'll do a long interlude where I explain, because there are many things that happen in the book that actually have happened in reality. Wow. But we just, I just, you know, put them in this fantasy world. There's um, one particular story where I took David to the playground, and another little boy came up to me, and, and you know, he tried to help David do things, and I was really impressed by that, because... So often you see kids, they're so afraid of, of somebody with that, that, that different from them. Yeah. And uh, he asked me, he said, is his brain broken? Uh, and I said, no, it's, it's just, it just works differently. Right. And he asked me if, um, if we could, you know, if there was something they could do to change his brain, like mm -hmm. put a new brain in him. And I said, well, you know, even if they could do that, he wouldn't be my son anymore. I didn't miss right. my son. Right. And I mean, and, you know, I'm talking to this little kid and this kid is actually making me you know weepy almost because it's just like i don't you, you have a kid with a severe, uh, severe disability you you still want that kid that that kid is still yours and yeah you know you love him no matter what and it's i mean i think that really is the heart of the story and i mean there's a big huge epic thing going on but i never stray away from the fact that you know this is a story about a father who's trying to protect his son and love his son and accept his son for who he is and try to get other people to do the same. And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm walking a fine line here because you want to do something that's both entertaining, but you, you don't want to go off message when you're trying to do something like this. So. Sure. But I got to tell you, you're quite the wordsmith. You've reduced me to a puddle just saying that I didn't find my voice until I had a child who didn't have a voice. You're killing me here. Yeah, uh, I'm literally the voice of the voiceless. Uh, you hear that so many times and oof. it's like... Yeah. You know, in, in political strata. But, yes. Let's t let's back up a little bit and talk about your journey. And is, is David your only child or do you have more children? No, David is my only child. Okay. And He's so my first. Uh, and how wonderful. <laughs> and there you go. And so at what point did you uh, realize was did your did your wife realize first? Did you realize what at what point but, did you see that he that he worked in a different way? Well, he was he was walking at seven months wow and he had just began Look certain um certain s syllables and, and and things so we just we actually thought he was on the fast track and then something happened that you yeah. probably hear about a lot so we don't yeah. need to go into what what that was sure. but then he suddenly came to a screeching halt and then started pedaling backwards and he never lost any of his physical ability but he was a blank slate for for a good eight months to a year and my wife was telling me there's something wrong and of course you know one of the parents is going to be in denial and i said there's nothing wrong um we took him to the doctor they said he was walking at seven months but he wasn't speaking at one so maybe his hearing's off mm -hmm. eventually my wife um, convinced me to let some people look at him and he was diagnosed with um, uh, mid to low functioning autism at 15 months and um, when I first heard it, I mean, your whole world blows up. I mean, and you know, we hear that story all the time. But um, I think, uh, I, I think, in a lot of ways, I've actually grown to accept it almost too much, mm. which is probably why. I mean, I, I worry sometimes that I'm being too, I'm not being thorough enough as a parent mm. to sort of advance his ability to do things, which. Uh, if I'm being completely honest. You know, I think we all feel that way. I think everybody, you know, it's it's one of these things that it's a job that the job is never done and you're constantly second guessing. And But you sound like an awesome parent to me, Sean, and an awesome advocate for your child and for all of our children. You also have a couple of blogs uh, that you do. Can we, can we plug those blogs for you? Can you tell us where to find them? Sure. Um, one of them is a Wizardly Wiles dot blogspot dot com and the other one is legends of the boo monster dot blogspot dot com and um the kickstarter page is a little bit harder to actually explain to people as far as the uh, I, I think we have that uh, uh that address though right emily that we can yeah. put up on the screen no we don't okay so tell oh. us how to get to the kickstarter page 
Okay, it is. Um, actually, if you just go to Kickstarter and go through the search and look for okay. Legends of the Boo Monster, and Boo okay. Monsters is hyphenated, just like Autism Live is. Okay. Um, and my name, of course, Sean Colton, you will probably find it pretty readily. So. Okay. And tell us, because I, a lot of people don't know what Kickstarter is. So explain what Kickstarter is and what we can do to be helping you to make sure that this book reaches completion and that we can actually have one. So to explain Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a crowdfunding site. And what you do is essentially you, you put up a proposal for a project of some kind, and then you ask for funding from you know, from yeah. the world, basically. Right. And you've got a you've got a small window of opportunity to work with. We have thirty days to get to five thousand dollars, which is the exact cost it's going to cost me to put the book together, make it really nice mm -hmm. and make it available for people, whether it's electronically or the way I prefer, you know, a hard copy, real paper. And but, is um, there, is there, because I've only done Kickstarter a couple of times, is there no minimum or is there a minimum of what you can give? Um, there is no minimum. Uh, well, you, there's a minimum of one dollar. Okay. But, but you know, and, when, uh, you, when you think about the world and all the different things and you can't do everything in the world, right? You can't help everybody to do their thing. But I often think about the whole, the power of a dollar. And, you know, that if you could give a dollar to a mom in India and change her world and change her life and change the world in general, how exciting would that be? And there have been a couple instances on the news where we've seen people who just said, uh, you know, anybody who has a dollar, we're trying to do something, and that it ends up being a huge thing. So, uh, you know, if you have more to give, uh, absolutely. But if everybody who was listening right now sent a dollar, this book would be become a reality right. um, a couple of times over. So uh, I want to encourage people to, and, and you go there and you can do it on, it's PayPal, isn't it? You can you can pay the dollar. It's, on, a, it's a PayPal-like thing, yeah, but it's not it's not actually PayPal. Okay. So you, can, you, you just use your credit card kind of thing. Okay. And you can you can donate a dollar to however much you want. We're right. actually, after 11 days, we're halfway funded, so we're in, we're in good shape. But if this thing doesn't get funded, then I'm going to cry. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, absolutely. And more to the point, we all lose because yeah. this is something that we can sit down and read with our children and and have a different understanding. And it's something you can give your child's school for the kids in your child's classroom to read. This is another tool for all of us. And also, I think any time that we have an opportunity to acknowledge another parent and say, I hear you, I see you, I see what you're doing and I appreciate it, uh, that's a good thing for us as people. So, yeah, and absolutely, if you have more to give than a dollar, please, please do. There's no limit of how much you could spend, but you know, it, I think we can all find a dollar between the couch cushions. Um, and so if you're listening and, and can do that, so go to kickstarter.com, right? It's dot com. Right. Mm -hmm. And search for Sean Colton, S-H-A-W-N, correct, Sean? That is correct. And Colton with a C, C-O-L-T-O-N. And you can also search for legends of the Boomeister with hyphens between each word, right? Not Except Meister, Monster. monster. Uh -huh. Oh, what is wrong with me today? So <laughs> Monster, legends of the Boo Monster with hyphens in between. And you can be, you can proudly someday own this book and say, I was a part of making this happen. You've made uh, a dream come true. That's right. And, and helping, uh, you know, I think, I believe in karma. What you put out comes back to you times two. So how much do you want to come back to you today? Send exactly half of that <laughs> and, uh, to Kickstarter for Sean. So, and you think that you're going to be done with the book by August, you said? I will be done with the book by August and it should be shipping in De uh, December at the latest. Um, the artwork and the, the layout and the publishing and all that stuff takes a little time. Okay. So I'll be, I'll be done with the book, actually final draft by August. And then after that, you got the production, and then by December at the latest. And the current plan is to self-publish, but if somebody is watching and knows a publisher uh, that you want to hook Sean up with, that's okay too, right, Sean? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, Legends of the Boo Monster. And <laughs> what a wonderful tribute to your child. And uh, we should also check at your uh, your blogs, Legends of the Boo Monster and Wizardly Wiles. That's correct? Wizardly Wiles is the one that's more David-focused. So. 
Okay. That's where this this audience would probably want to go. And is it okay to mention right before we came on the air, you were talking about that you've had some stuff going on in your life that has really made you up your commitment to what you're doing. Are you, is it okay to share about that? Absolutely. Yeah. And sure. so you got a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, last year I got a diagnosis of prostate cancer. I'm so sorry. And, and well, it's gone now because so is the prostate. But the thing is, is that I had to make a decision on how I wanted to go about treating it. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the thought of me being dead, and even if it's a slow growing cancer, me being dead in 20 years isn't, isn't feasible. So I went through the most radical surgery you can have and just got rid of the whole thing. So now I'm cancer free, which is good. Yeah. There are a lot of complications from that. But I, I think that, you know, I often think if this, my situation were different and if my son were going to be able to take care of himself in 10 years, maybe I wouldn't have made that decision yeah. because it is, it was a radical procedure. But yeah, we make the decisions we have based on the, the kids that we have. And right. uh, you're an awesome dad and an inspiration to all of us, Sean. And I want to hear back from you at the end. When is the 30 days up? Uh, it is up on June thirtieth. That's okay. the end of the thing. So. Okay. Can we hear back will, from you and 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 know that you were able to get the funding? Will you let us know? Absolutely. Any I'm, anytime you want to talk to me is, is okay is, is with me. And I have to say, you know, uh, the other day I read some of your blogs. It's good stuff. You're a wordsmith. So. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, nothing uh, but the best wishes to you and to your family. And clearly, you're a guy who can get it done. We were looking at this Kickstarter video, and you managed to get Sandra Bernhardt to be in your Kickstarter video. You are a guy who can get it done. I, I hope so. I, be I, my I believe wife calls you can. me a little bit of a mutant that way. <laughs> well, you know, uh, who better? Who better to be able to do that and that you have somebody who is drawing pictures of you as you morph into the superhero that we all know you to be now. Uh, I think that's perfect. Oh, I wish. But yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Sean, it's been such a pleasure and definitely check back with us. Keep us posted. But for all of you watching, send a dollar. Um, find it between the couch cushions and send a dollar so that this book can become a reality. And I do believe in the law of uh, karma. It will come back to you times two. And if you have more to send than a dollar, how much better is that? Sean, we wish you nothing but the best and we'll check back with you. Okay, thank you very much, Shannon. You have a great show. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, again, that was uh, blogger dad, Sean Colton. He is writing, working on, and you saw some lovely illustrations while we were talking to him for Legends of the Boo Monster. I'm going to get it right. Uh, find him on kickstarter.com. It's Sean Colton, S-H-A-W-N, Colton, C-O-L-T-O-N. The book is Legends of the Boo Meister with hyphens in between. And monster, I said it again. What is wrong with me? Uh, it's that kind of, it's Monday. Uh, in any case, Boo Monster. Now we'll all remember it because I can't. Boo Monster. And support this dad, right? We got to support each other. And uh, it's a dollar. Uh, you can't go wrong. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we've got some really interesting, I promised you a TED Talk, so uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back, and I'll intro what that's all about. Stick with us. Act Today, or Autism Care and Treatment Today, was founded in 2004 by several passionate parents who believe that access to early, effective treatment is vital for individuals with autism. Together with Dr. Doreen graham Pache, the world's leading provider of therapy for autism, this group created Act Today to do just as the name implies, take action immediately to treat autism spectrum disorders. A lot of families and parents and even uh, physicians don't yet accept the fact that we are recovering children with autism. In 2006, inspired by her struggle to get treatment for her young son Wyatt, television producer and author Nancy Allspot Jackson and her husband Reed hosted a backyard benefit for the foundation called Denim and Diamonds for Autism. Tens of thousands of dollars were raised, and in 2008, Allspot Jackson took the helm of Act Today as executive director. 
We have, this country has to come together to save a generation of children. With a dedicated board of directors, a small but committed staff called the A-Team as an autism, ACT Today is making a huge difference in the lives of children across the country. Grants that fund programs for behavior therapy, special needs schools and summer camps, medical needs like diagnostic tests and special diets, basic safety equipment such as helmets for children who repetitively bang their heads, and fencing for those who wander, assisted technologies and assistance dogs. Hi, my name is Max, and I love my iPad too. It's so great, I can take photos, in 2010, Act for Military Families became the first national campaign to benefit military children with autism. I'm Joe Montagna. As a father of a daughter with autism, I know the challenges that brings. Act Today continues to educate and raise national awareness on the need for early and intensive intervention for an epidemic that affects at least one in 110 children. I called on November 1st. And I'm like, how am I going to get notified? How are you going to let me know? And they ended up looking and they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. Act Today, fulfilling its mission of helping families with autism, one child at a time. Welcome back. We were just talking with Sean Colton, author of the book Legends of the Boo Monster, and asking you to donate at least a dollar on Kickstarter so that his book can happen. And Emily was just sharing with me, if you go to the Kickstarter page, they have lots of other bonus things there, as sometimes they do on Kickstarter, and I'd forgotten that. Um, but for, if you donate $25, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that come with that, um, and you can get a copy of the ebook. But the thing that really caught my eye that I thought was just so cool is that they will base a character on the book after someone that you want and give them a line of dialogue for $25, which I got to tell you, that's exciting to me as a parent um, because I'm going to do that for my son. I'm just going to say that right now, that I'm going to go to Kickstarter today and uh, donate $25 and have them base a character on my son with one line of dialogue because that will make his day. Um, so that's really exciting. And if you have $25, you know, woohoo, what a wonderful thing is that. So, um, Oh, I, and I was just saying to Emily to love when we have, it's always wonderful when we have moms on the show and they talk about their children, but it's, I don't know, there's something extra special for me when we talk to the dads. Uh, it just is a fabulous thing. So, so thrilled to have a chance to talk to him. What a great dad. Um, so go to Kickstarter, Sean Colton, the book Legends of the Boo Monster, not Meister, Monster, and if you want a character uh, based on your kid or yourself, but I want one for my kid. All right. Uh, I think that's a lovely, lovely gift for him down the road. Um, also, I, I totally see I got so excited about that. I forgot what we were coming back to. Oh, we're going to talk about the TED Talk. Um, we're going to show a TED Talk. We talk about perspective taking. And we know that that's a really important thing with autism, that uh, the folks with Simon Baron Cohen did the Sally Ann test a while back. That's the one where they took three groups of kids. There were the neurotypical kids, the kids who had um, Down's syndrome, and then a group of kids who had autism spectrum diagnosis. They were all the same age, an age in which we expect perspective taking to be present, where you can consider another person's point of view, right? They did a test with them called the Sally Ann, where they had the two, they showed them a cartoon, basically of two little girls, and they're in the room, and one little girl takes a ball and sticks it inside of something. And then that child leaves the room. The other girl takes the ball out of where it is hidden and hides it someplace else. The first girl comes back into the room and they ask the kids, where does the girl who was outside the room think the ball is? Well, the kids that were neurotypical were able to take her perspective and realize when she was last in the room, she put the ball in the basket. That's where she's going to say the ball is. And they said, she's going to say it's in the, it's in the basket, even though they knew the ball was not there. Great. That was 
the expectation. Then they came to the kids with Down syndrome and said, where does she think the ball is? And overwhelmingly, they all got it right too. They were able to take her perspective at the age of five, they were like five to seven, I think, and say she thinks it's in the basket, even though they knew the ball was hidden someplace else. Then they asked the kids with autism and overwhelmingly, they got it wrong. This is a part of the puzzle that makes autism different than other diagnoses is that there is a failure to take perspective. They are looking and think about all the different ways with your child, if your child has this, that, you know, somebody else is upset and they're laughing because they, they're not taking the other person's perspective and considering, you know, what it is to feel what they're feeling. They tend to think that if they're hungry, you're hungry. Uh, if they're cold, you're cold and not taking other people's perspectives. So is this something we can teach? Is this something that we could change or are we just stuck with it? Well, as we learn with a lot of stuff in ABA, we're not stuck with anything. We can work on anything. Uh, and there are some really great lessons and skills, by the way, on sensory perspective taking, which builds to perspective taking. Uh, and we did this with my child and my child now takes perspective. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But recently they did a TED talk looking at how a typically developing child gains perspective taking, how it happens over a period of time. Now, uh, it's that's what we're going to look at is how typical children do, but it's always interesting for us to look at how the skill is learned completely in the environment so we can target it when we're working on it with ABA. So let's take a look at this TED Talk and then we'll try to apply it to children with autism. Here it is. What is going on in this baby's mind? If you'd asked people this 30 years ago, most people, including psychologists, would have said that this baby was irrational, illogical, egocentric, that he couldn't take the perspective of another person or understand cause and effect. In the last 20 years, developmental science has completely overturned that picture. So in some ways, we think that this baby's thinking is like the thinking of the most brilliant scientists. Let me give you just one example of this. One thing that this baby could be thinking about, that could be going on in his mind, is trying to figure out what's going on in the mind of that other baby. After all, one of the things that's hardest for all of us to do is to figure out what other people are thinking and feeling. And maybe the hardest thing of all is to figure out that what other people think and feel isn't actually exactly like what we think and feel. Anyone who's followed politics can testify to how hard that is for some people to get. We wanted to know if babies and young children could understand this really profound thing about other people. Now, the question is, how could we ask them? Babies, after all, can't talk, and if you ask a three-year-old to tell you what he thinks, what you'll get is a beautiful stream-of-consciousness monologue about ponies and birthdays and things like that. So how could we actually ask them the question? Well, it turns out that the secret was broccoli. What we did, Betty Repicoli, who was one of my students and I, was actually to give the babies two bowls of food, one bowl of raw broccoli and one bowl of delicious goldfish crackers. Now, all of the babies, even in Berkeley, like the crackers and don't like the raw broccoli. <laughs> but then what Betty did was to take a little taste of food from each bowl and she would act as if she liked it or she didn't. So half the time, she acted as if she liked the crackers and didn't like the broccoli, just like the baby and any other sane person. But half the time, what she would do is take a little bit of the broccoli and go, mmm, broccoli, I tasted the broccoli, mmm. And then she would take a little bit of the crackers and she'd go, oh, yuck, crackers. I tasted the crackers, ooh, yuck. So she'd act as if what she wanted was just the opposite of what the babies wanted. We did this with 15 and 18 month old babies. And then she would simply put her hand out and say, can you give me some? So the question is, what would the baby give her? What they liked or what she liked? And the remarkable thing was that 18 month old babies, just barely walking and talking, would give her the crackers if she liked the crackers, but they would give her the broccoli if she liked the broccoli. 
On the other hand, 15-month-olds would stare at her for a long time if she acted as if she liked the broccoli, like they couldn't figure this out. <laughs> but then after they stared for a long time, they would just give her the crackers, what they thought everybody must like. So there are two really remarkable things about this. The first one is that these little 18-month-old babies have already discovered this really profound fact about human nature, that we don't always want the same thing. And what's more, they thought that they should actually do things to help other people get what they wanted. Even more remarkably, though, the fact that the 15-month-olds didn't do this suggests that these 18-month-olds had learned this deep, profound fact about human nature in the three months from the time they were 15 months old. So children both know more and learn more than we ever would have thought. And this is just one of hundreds and hundreds of studies over the last 20 years that's actually demonstrated this. The question you might ask, though, is why do children learn so much, and how is it possible for them to learn so much in such a short time? I mean, after all, if you look at babies superficially, they seem pretty useless. And actually, in many ways, they're worse than useless, because we have to put so much time and energy into just keeping them alive. But if we turn to evolution for an answer to this puzzle of why we spend so much time taking care of useless babies, um, it turns out that there's actually an answer. If we look across many, many different species of animals, not just us primates, but also including other mammals, birds, even uh, marsupials like kangaroos and wombats, it turns out that there's a relationship between how long a childhood a, a species has and how big their brains are compared to their bodies and how smart and flexible they are. And sort of the poster birds for this idea are the birds up there. On one side is a New Caledonian crow. And crows and other corvids, ravens, rooks, and so forth, are incredibly smart birds. They're as smart as chimpanzees in some respects. And this is a bird on the cover of Science who's learned how to use a tool to get food. On the other hand, we have our friend the domestic chicken, and chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys are basically as dumb as stumps. So they're very, very good at pecking for grain, and they're not much good at doing anything else. Well, it turns out that the babies, the New Caledonian crow babies, are fledglings. They depend on their moms to drop worms in their little open mouths for as long as two years, which is a really long time in the life of a bird, whereas the chickens are actually mature within a couple of months. So childhood is the reason why the crows end up on the cover of science and the chickens end up in the soup pot. There's something about that long childhood that seems to be connected to knowledge and learning. Well, what kind of exc explanation could we have for this? Well, some animals, like the chicken, seem to be beautifully suited to doing just one thing very well. So they seem to be beautifully suited to packing grain in one environment. Other creatures, like the crows, aren't very good at doing anything in particular, but they're extremely good at learning about lots of different environments. And of course, we human beings are way out on the end of the distribution, like the crows. We have bigger brains relative to our bodies by far than any other animal. We're smarter, we're more flexible, we can learn more. We survive in more different environments. We've migrated to cover the world and even go to outer space. And our babies and children are dependent on us for much longer than the babies of any other species. My son is 23, and uh, at least until they're 23, we're still popping those worms into those little open mouths. All right, why would we see this correlation? Well, an idea is that that strategy, that learning strategy, is an extremely powerful, great strategy for getting on in the world, but it has one big disadvantage. And that one big disadvantage is that until you actually do all that learning, you're going to be helpless. So you don't want to have the mastodon charging at you and be saying to yourself, a slingshot or maybe a spear might work, which would actually be better. You want to know all that before the mastodons actually show up. And the way that evolution seems to have solved that problem is with a kind of division of labor. So the idea is that we have this early period when we're completely protected, we don't have to do anything, all we have to do is learn. And then as adults, we can take all those things that we learned when we were babies and children and actually put them to work to do things out there in the world. So one way of thinking about it is that babies and young children are like the research and development division of the human species. So they're the protected blue sky guys who just have to go out and learn and have good ideas, and we're production and marketing. 
we have to take all those ideas that we learned when we were children and uh, actually put them to use. Another way of thinking about it is instead of thinking about babies and children as being like defective grown-ups, we should think about them as being a different developmental stage of the same species, kind of like caterpillars and butterflies, except that they're actually the brilliant butterflies who are flitting around the garden and exploring, and we're the caterpillars who are inching along our narrow grown-up adult path. If this is true, if these babies are designed to learn, and this evolutionary story would say children are for learning, that's what they're for, we might expect that they would have really powerful learning mechanisms. And in fact, the baby's brain seems to be the most powerful learning computer on the planet. But real computers are actually getting to be a lot better. And there's been a revolution in our understanding of machine learning recently, and it all depends on the ideas of this guy, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who was a statistician and mathematician in the 18th century. And essentially, what Bayes did was to provide a mathematical way, using probability theory, to characterize, to describe the way that scientists find out about the world. So what scientists do is they have a hypothesis that they think might be likely to start with, they go out and test it against the evidence, the evidence makes them change that hypothesis, then they test that new hypothesis, and so on and so forth. And what Bayes showed was a mathematical way that you could do that. And that mathematics is at the core of the best machine learning programs that we have now. And some 10 years ago, I suggested that babies might be doing the same thing. So if you want to know what's going on underneath those beautiful brown eyes, I think it actually looks something like this. This is Reverend Bayes' notebook. So I think those babies are actually making complicated calculations with conditional probabilities that they're revising to figure out how the world works. All right, now that might seem like an even taller order to actually demonstrate, because after all, if you ask even grown-ups about statistics, they look extremely stupid. How could it be that children are doing statistics? So to test this, we used a machine that we have called the Blicket Detector. This is a box that lights up and plays music when you put some things on it and not others. And using this very simple machine, my lab and others have done dozens of studies showing just how good babies are at learning about the world. Let me mention just one that we did with Tamara Kushner, my student. If I showed you this detector, you would be likely to think, to begin with, that the way to make the detector go would be to put a block on top of the detector. But actually, this detector works in a bit of a strange way. Because if you wave a block over the top of the detector, something you wouldn't ever think of to begin with, the detector will actually activate two out of three times. Whereas if you do the likely thing, put the block on the detector, it will only activate two out of six times. Um, so the unlikely hypothesis actually has stronger evidence. It looks as if the waving is a more effective strategy than the other strategy. So we did just this. We gave four-year-olds this pattern of evidence, and we just asked them to make it go. And sure enough, the four-year-olds used the evidence to wave the object on top of the detector. Now, there are two things that are really interesting about this. The first one is, again, remember, these are four-year-olds. They're just learning how to count. But unconsciously, they're doing these quite complicated calculations that will give them a conditional probability measure. And the other interesting thing is that they're using that evidence to get to an idea, get to a hypothesis about the world that seems very unlikely to begin with. And in studies we've just been doing in my lab, similar studies, we've shown that four-year-olds are actually better at finding out an unlikely hypothesis than adults are when we give them exactly the same task. So in these circumstances, the children are using statistics to find out about the world. But after all, scientists also do experiments. And we wanted to see if children are doing experiments. When children do experiments, we call it getting into everything or else playing. And there's been a bunch of interesting experiment uh, studies recently that have shown that this playing around is really a kind of experimental research program. Here's one from Christine Laguerre's lab. What Christine did was use our blicket detectors and what she did was show children that yellow ones made it go and red ones didn't, and then she showed them an anomaly. And what you'll see is that this little boy will go through five hypotheses in the space of two minutes. Okay, so he's just, his first hypothesis has just been falsified. Okay, he's got his experimental notebook out.
every scientist will recognize that expression of despair, right? Always, because this needs to be like this, and this needs to be like that. Okay, hypothesis two. That's why. <laughs> now, this is his next idea. He tells the experiment to do this, to try putting it out over onto the other location. Not working either. Oh, because the light goes only to here, not here. Oh. The bottom of this box has electricity in here, but this doesn't have electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the fourth oh. hypothesis. It's, it's lighting up! <laughs> so we need to put four. <laughs> so we need to put four on this one to make it light up, and two on this one to make it light okay, up. Okay, there's the fifth hypothesis. Now that is a particularly... That is a particularly adorable and articulate little boy, but what Christine discovered is this is actually quite typical. If you look at the way children play when you ask them to explain something, what they really do is do a series of experiments. This is actually pretty typical of four-year-olds. Well, what's it like to be this kind of creature? What's it like to be one of these brilliant butterflies who can test five hypotheses in two minutes? Well, if you go back to those psychologists and philosophers, a lot of them had said that babies and young children were barely conscious if they were conscious at all. And I think just the opposite is true. I think babies and children are actually more conscious than we are as adults. Now, here's what we know about how adult consciousness works. And adult attention and consciousness look kind of like a spotlight. So what happens for adults is we decide that something's relevant or important, we should pay attention to it. Our consciousness of that thing that we're attending to becomes extremely bright and vivid, and everything else sort of goes dark. And we even know something about the brain, the way the brain does this. So what happens when we pay attention is that the prefrontal cortex, the sort of executive part of our brain, sends a signal that makes a little part of our brain much more flexible, more plastic, better at learning, and shuts down activity in all the rest of our brains. So we have a very focused, purpose-driven kind of attention. Uh, if we look at babies and young children, we see something very different. I think babies and young children seem to have more of a lantern of consciousness than a spotlight of consciousness. So babies and young children are very bad at narrowing down to just one thing, but they're very good at taking in lots of information from lots of different sources at once. And if you actually look in their brains, you see that they're flooded with these neurotransmitters that are really good at inducing learning and plasticity, and the inhibitory parts haven't come on yet. So when we say that babies and young children are bad at paying attention, what we really mean is that they're bad at not paying attention. So they're bad at getting rid of all the interesting things that could tell them something and just looking at the thing that's important. That's the kind of attention, the kind of consciousness that we might expect from those butterflies who are designed to learn. Well, if we want to think about a way of getting a taste of that kind of baby consciousness as adults, I think the best thing is think about cases where we're put in a new situation that we've never been in before when we fall in love with someone new, or when we're in a new city for the first time. And what happens then is not that our consciousness contracts, it expands, so that those three days in Paris seem to be more full of consciousness and experience than all the months of being a walking, talking, faculty meeting, attending zombie back home. <laughs> and by the way, that coffee, that wonderful coffee you've been drinking downstairs, actually mimics the effect of those baby neurotransmitters. So what's it like to be a baby? It's like being in love in Paris for the first time after you've had three double espressos, <laughs> which is, that's a fantastic way to be, but it does tend to leave you waking up crying at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, it's good to be a grown-up. I don't want to say too much about how wonderful babies are. It's good to be a grown-up. We can do things like tie our shoelaces and cross the street by ourselves. And it makes sense that we put a lot of effort into actually making babies think like adults do. But if what we want is to be like those butterflies, to have open-mindedness, open learning, imagination, creativity, innovation, maybe at least some of the time we should be getting the adults to start thinking more like children.
Welcome back to Autism Live. So we were just watching a TED Talk uh, that in the beginning was about perspective taking, but in a large sense was about children and how they learn versus how adults learn. Um, pretty fascinating. I do love TED Talks. Uh, and always very interesting. And I specifically wanted us to look at this. Uh, well, it was very cute kid, right? And Emily was the one who found this and said, you know, this is so interesting and about perspective taking. But we see that with these, uh, first of all, the first thing that struck me was that there is this window. We've always looked at perspective taking as something that came much later, but now they're saying, you know, in their research, it's looking like it's something that happens between 15 months of age and 18 months of age, which is very interesting because that's when we see our children change a lot of the time. Not always, uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting window in which that skill comes and we see with kids on the spectrum that skill is missing so uh, very fascinating if you look at it in terms of that but also this whole idea of you know saying to the children well here are the here are the fish and here are the the broccoli and which one do you think she's gonna want and then being able to demonstrate for them and say okay well I don't I don't like the fish I like the broccoli and the 18 months get it well this is a very similar to how we teach Teach this to children on the spectrum. Of course, there are a lot of precursor lessons that lead to that lesson, and we actually have a videotape, but it's so, uh, the quality is not something that I want to show it to you, but uh, it's shown a lot at conferences here. Uh, the center, the people who work at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders will, will show this frequently. It's an amazing videotape where a therapist is sitting with a real child with autism, and she has a lollipop and she has a bottle of salad dressing. And she, you would think, you know, she asks the child, which one would you like? And he picks the lollipop, of course. And, but then she licks on the lollipop and she makes a terrible face and goes, ugh, ugh. and then she drinks the salad dressing on a spoon and she goes, mmm. And she says, give me one. And he, first time he gives her the lollipop because he's still looking at it from her perspective. And she goes over it again and she says, oh, yuck, lollipop, ugh, ugh, you know, make, real exaggerated face. And then she has the salad dressing, mmm, salad dressing is good. And she puts them back, both back down in front of him and says, um, give me one. And you see this moment where he sits there and he looks, and this is a very small child with autism, and he looks at the salad dressing and he looks at the, the lollipop and he looks at her and you see him thinking. You see that moment, just like we saw with this neurotypical four-year-old and then he hands her the salad dressing. And of course she's yay and reinforcing that and saying how awesome that is. But the, they literally caught it on tape the very first time that that particular child, uh, and I happen to know the mother um, of, of that particular child because that's the mom that I ran into that said, oh, you, you gotta go get ABA for your child. Um, and it was her child. And she still to this day talks about that and says, boy, that was the moment. And they just happened to catch it on videotape. Now, there were a lot more moments uh, in his life that came along where he learned other things. But that was the first moment that he ever took somebody else's perspective. Um, a really amazing thing to have caught on tape. So I want you to know that we can teach these things to our children. There are lessons in skills, and I, I've said to you before, I love skills, and if you have no other way of getting ABA, use skills. It's really affordable, and if you have problems with the, the cost of it, write and let us know, and we'll put you in touch with people who do grants for that kind of thing. But at least, and uh, fabulous lessons in skills, and, they, and that lesson is in there. Uh, but we can teach these things to children, and it has far-reaching effects that I, I know I shared that last year when my son was graduating from his ABA program and having his eighth birthday party before the party we were going through you know some of the rules and and I said you know and some people are going to give you presents and they're not going to be the things you want and how are you going to behave and he says well I'm going to thank them and I said well why and he goes because they went to a whole lot of trouble to get me a present and they must have thought that I wanted it and I don't want to hurt their feelings <sighs> Right? I, amazing, amazing. And I can promise you that a year before my child would, I know when we did the seventh birthday party and I said, okay, and when people give you a gift, if somebody gives you something, what are you gonna say? Well, it depends, is it something I like? <laughs> Right? Which was huge progress from when he was four. And, you know, I said, we're having a birthday party, and he didn't know what that meant. Um, you know, so 
there, there is progress to be made, but we can teach perspective taking to our children. And we can, in lots of different ways, teaching the problem solving of that four year old who's there and trying to figure it out. I also want to note, too, that, you know, I know sometimes it's hard to watch that kind of a video and you think, but my child is not there. But what I want you to hear is the good part where she's saying that children's brains are more pliable when they're younger and we can get in there and get more done and that they really believe that part of that period of time is so that they don't have to worry about other things. Uh, well, that's why it's so important for us to give our kids, our kids, that early intervention because their brains are more pliable then. And did you see that she mentioned that it's seems like babies are unable to attend to some things when in fact it's that they can't narrow down what they're focusing on. That's why we do DTT because our children are having trouble. They have sensory issues and they have even more trouble narrowing it down. So they're not learning those specific little things. That's why we encapsulate those little behaviors into little bubbles so that there's a something that happens, the behavior and the consequence. And that's when our kids get it. When we wipe out the distraction for them. That's why we do ABA. That's why DTT is an important part of ABA. That's how we get that information to our children by taking care of everything else. So all they have to attend to is this one lesson and it works. It works. And that's the fabulous thing. Um, really interesting. I, I love watching the TED Talks. Uh, and I hope that you guys do too, because from time to time when it it goes hand in hand with the things we're talking about we like to show so thank you to Emily for finding that clip for us and sometime in the future I'll see if we can get a better copy of the videotape of the therapist with a lollipop and the salad dressing because it's really kind of exciting we are out of time for this show but uh, I always like to remind you guys this, as the show ends the conversation continues you can always email us you can Facebook us you can Twitter uh, Emily's gonna cycle through all the different ways you can Skype with us uh, we had a wonderful guest today, Sean Colton, who Skyped with us. Uh, I hope that if you're interested in doing that, that you'll let us know. But let us know your thoughts, your questions, your concerns, always. We're so interested in that. If there's a topic we're not covering, let us know, because we'll we'll get an expert in here. Uh, lots of different ways to watch us. Emily's cycling through those for you right now. Blip TV, YouTube, on uh, iTunes, all of those wonderful ways that you can participate. I hope that you'll tune in when you can, uh, watch in the way that suits you, give us your thoughts and your concerns and your questions, uh, because that helps all of us. And, um, I, I hope that you'll also take the time to go to Kickstarter and whether it's a dollar or $25 or $125, if you've got it to give for the wonderful book, Legends of the Boo Monster, Legends of the Boo Monster, Sean Colton, S-H-A-W-N, Colton, C-O-L-T-O-N. Also want to remind you, if you watched two weeks ago, that you can vote for free um, for the film, um, not forgotten the movie.com and it's for free you can vote so that they can get that film about autism in the ukraine ukraine excuse me made we're going to be back tomorrow with a special guest uh we'll look forward to seeing you then i uh, also want to remind you that on thursday we have a really incredible guest jan blatcher she is the founding director of search the family autism resource center at the university of california riverside she's going to be with us on Thursday. Really looking forward to that. Uh, until tomorrow, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.